questions. <clears throat> Good evening. Chante wa shte na pe chiu zapi. Chanu pa mani we manchi api. My American English name is Monique Muffy Muso. I just uh, told you my Indian name is Walks with the Pipe Woman. I'm here today at the Hesapa at the Holiday Inn in Rapid City, South Dakota. We're right beside the monument, the old Civic Center. I'm here with my wife. I'll let her introduce herself. Good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Felipa De Leon, uh, is my English name. Tekiki Lobby is my uh, Native American name. Um, we're happy to be here this evening to talk about um, issues, the water issues, uh, environmental issues. Um, we are Uniting Resilience Indigenous Water Alliance. Thank you. I'd like to first introduce um, our, our guests for starting tonight off. And I'd like to say um, it's pretty windy out there, so all of us have a lot of hairspray on keeping it in place but we've got 65 mile an hour gusts going on outside of uh, rapid city right now and so i hope everybody's safe and and enjoying the evening and uh we're gonna go ahead and get started i'm gonna uh introduce uh we're very very honored and and so um happy that we have our uh, chief of the sea chahu lakota oyate uh, Chief John Spotted Tail and, and his wife is Tamara stands and looks back Spotted Tail. They are both here and I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you time to introduce yourself and then we'll go ahead and start asking some questions. However, whichever one of you wants to start out. Yeah, my name is uh, Chief John Spotted Tail. My Lakota name is uh, Sinte Gleska, and I'm of the Sichangu Lakota Oyate, and uh, I'm from the community of Parmalee on the Rosebud Indian Reservation. Greetings, everyone. My name is Hakita Najinwia Kahuakbale Machiapi, Sichangu Lakota Oyate, and my name is Tamara Stands and Looks Back Spotted Tail. I'm originally, my family is from Wood, South Dakota. And my mother is from Antelope, South Dakota, both um, members of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Again, thank you, and it's a great honor to be here amongst all of you. Um, we're gonna, um, we brought, we're bringing people together and we, we had a meeting on Monday. It's a real fast put together everything, but we're dealing with some really hard issues on, you know, that are affecting Mother Earth. And Uniting Resilience uh, not only deals with our uh, LGBTQ Native Two-Spirit, we also in, deal with protecting Mother Earth. And, and one of our big topics that's happening and has always happened throughout in Native country is the Mini Ki Le Wakan, our, our sacred water. And it's always been, um, right now I feel is, is, it's always been important, but it's, it's the meaning of life for our people. And, and she's the life giver, just like Mother Earth is the life giver. You can't go without the water in any, any way, shape or form, you know, where it's, it's, it helps us in our birth. It helps us in our nurturing throughout our life, and it helps restore um, our need for 
re restoration within our own selves and within our own um, environmental minerals throughout Mother Earth. And, and we are just under attack with all of these issues. And we have some very important things coming up as far as uh, support. And we've asked, um, we put together really quick this Indigenous Water Alliance and brought together some really grassroots people from throughout the Ocheti Shakoi in the state of South Dakota on how they can can we can all help each other in helping with with getting these um, issues addressed as far as the water. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Philippa ask some questions. Um, yes, you would like to. Okay, so my first question I'm going to have is going to go to John, uh, uh, Chief John. Um, how how can we how can we uh, get our tribal officials to stop from having the lateral violence and to unite so we can come together with uh, these water this water issues that we're having within the Ochete Shakowi. You know, that's kind of a hard question with the uh, tribal officials, you know, they, they kind of do what they want to do and, and um, you know, there's a lot of trainings for them when they get into office, but uh, many of them don't attend those trainings. So, you know, they, they don't learn what those trainings uh, are there to teach them. And um, uh, you know, and I'm not really sure how how to get involved, how to get them involved. You know, maybe maybe they need to just come to some meetings and get involved and learn some things from the people that are putting the meetings on. You know, that's that's the only thing I can think of right now. Hey, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so my next question is going to go to Tamara. Okay, um, so what we're doing. Uh, what we do is we're, we we tested some water um, on the uh, water issues. So how can we accomplish? Um, oh, I got lost there. <laughs> how can we accomplish a vic uh, victories on our environmental issues on our indig indigenous lands? That's a very interesting question and typically would take a lot of time to really think about those things. Um, I think the victories would come in a form of people coming together in our communities and taking action through the communities to form resolutions um, to be brought to council and then council passing those resolutions and making them into law. Um, we have a lot of issues environmentally that are impacting us as indigenous people, but not only us, but all walks of life and even upon Unchi Maka, Mother Earth, that are just now recently, you know, no longer going to be able to kind of brush under the rug. We need to take a stronger approach and you know, I remember my grandfather telling me a long time ago that, you know, it's time for all of you pipe carriers and people who pray to stand up now and pray for Mother Earth. But then we also know that Mother Earth will always take care of herself, that when there's a time of cleansing, she will shake. When there's a thing that she needs to eliminate, you know, those things will automatically, naturally come forth within a balance of nature. And I think now today we're starting to see a lot of those things through earthquakes, hurricanes, um, volcanic eruptions. And so, you know, I think Mother Earth is trying to tell us something and we need to become aware of that and listen. And so when we accomplish these environmental issues on our own indigenous lands, we are indigenous people. We're already on our lands. Every land that we are we're not just confined to a small border area everywhere we walk upon 
this great turtle island is part of indigenous lands and we need to be mindful of that and i think um making those changes is going to take a huge collective effort on all indigenous people to bring that awareness wow that is awesome i really appreciate that that's a powerful answer thank you um john on monday we invite, we had our meeting on Monday the 13th here at the Holiday Inn and we invited John and a few other, we tried to get together at least 10 to 12 people that we last minute put together last week and just right up to, I think even Sunday, we were trying to get people together to address these um, unifying issues and, and something happened in Monday's meeting that uh, really sent chills through through my body, and and I think everybody in that room felt that, and and um, and you kind of talk about that with uh, what was his name? Um, Mince from Standing Rock. Him Mince. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know we uh. I think it was about maybe 10 years ago or longer that um, they had a meeting up there in Standing Rock that I attended and uh, I had no idea that that this was gonna happen and it happened up there. You know, Tim got up and um, talked to the people and told them that uh, many years ago, back in the 1800s, 1861, he said, uh, um, I guess it was one of Spotted Tail's daughters that had passed away, and uh, he knew that the family was grieving, and that they invited them to come up to Standing Rock. And uh, I'm not sure who all went, but, uh, you know, Spotted Tail, his family, and Probably a lot of the relatives went up there, and uh, they had a big ceremony for them up there. And and um, they had a song made for them while they were there. And and it was pretty touching the first time that they 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 um, sang the song and honored us up there at Standing Rock. And uh, I've seen Tim many times before, and and uh, I think this was the first time we were together again in a, in a setting like this, uh, a meeting. And um, when I get to talk, and and uh, when I was finished, then to my surprise, you know, Tim was on the list right behind me to talk, and uh, you know, he talked about that the ceremony and things that his family did mm -hmm. for Spotted Tail's family back in 1861 up there at Standing Rock. And it was pretty touching. And, you know, I really appreciate what he said. And I, I think this time we might have got some recordings of it. And uh, hopefully we get a copy of that so that we can look at this and uh, remember what happened it was it was very very good for uh, myself and everyone there that uh, was part of it there were people that come up and told me that they were they uh, they were very touched and they cried during that time yeah, yeah. and it touched a lot of people and, you know Hopefully someday it can happen again where more of the family members could be there and hear this and yeah. hear the song that was sung. That was amazing because, I mean, just out of the blue and it just brought everybody to stand ovation. I mean, they, and I mean, it, I was involved in ceremonies like that, like in when I was five and you know maybe eight years old, and then I I remember some of the ceremonies started going away like that, where 
these Ayapahas come up and, and they talk and he said, you know, um, boy, he gave um, a full-blown history lesson right there. And these kind of things need to be passed on and that's what we're trying to do in Uniting Resilience because, you know, you, you're part of a family that um, fought at the Little Bighorn. All of us are. We all have those ancestral bloodlines and, and uh, you know, we, we res we're resilient people and, and that's what came together on Monday night and I couldn't believe that the Hunkbapa and the Two Kettle, you know, um, from the Sitting Bull uh, tribe came together and really honored, honored Chief Tail. And I really, really appreciate that. And I'm so blessed and thankful that I was a part of that. That was very, very ceremonial for every single person in that room. And, and you know, we, some of the batteries went out, you know, and I remember uh, we talked to Tim a little bit afterwards and he's a powerful guy. He's He's got good words and, you know, they were while trying to get some some interviews with him and and you know I was telling Chuck that you know it's pretty sacred so that why those batteries were running out at some of the things the messages he was he was giving at those times but we did was able to record the full song so we'll have that available for you and to pass on to your next generations and I really appreciate that. I just had to get that out there with, with you guys because uh, I don't know if I haven't been to any, I mean, within this this um, century, I haven't been to any function that it moved me in, in that way where those are the, our old, old songs that were sang back in 1861 and Tim passed that on and that was very, very powerful and it made my, even now it made my hair stand up just thinking about it, but uh, we came together today specifically to talk about um, a lot of issues. And I I know um, we we touched on a lot of it on Monday and, and I, Mara, I was talking to you on the phone on these matriarchal, matriarchal movement on, um, let's visit about that because I would like for that to be out in this live stream about how our women never signed the treaty and, and how we uh, are kind of um, very disrespected at some of these gatherings, especially these treaty um, conferences. And, and there's really a lot of rules and regulations and protocols and you know, kind of like a dictatorship that's going on. And I just wanted you to touch on some of that and how we're, we should try to dispel all of those feelings and how do you feel about that and how do we address that? That's a good question. That is a good question. And, you know, I, I've often wondered myself, you know, I've had to bear witness to a lot of things and I've seen a lot of things. And a lot of times I remain quiet um, my grandmother always said, you know, when a person prays with the chinupa and you smoke the pipe, you should be careful with your words and things that are said and conscious of, you know, what comes out. But on the other end, you know, we're having to, as women, address a lot of issues that are going on today in this world that is no longer of the past, but here we are today having to defend ourselves and having to speak on behalf of our women and our, our children and our daughters. And as Lakota Wiyans, you know, we're, we're the backbone of our nation. We're the givers of life. And we walk that line between life and death when we give birth. We also are able to feed our, our children and we create nations. And a lot of times I've had to remind some of our men of the story of De Sanwi. It was a woman who brought the Chinupa, who brought this way of life to our people. And it was a woman, you know, who reminds us that today, you know, that pipe represents both man and woman. And when we came to a consensus many, many years ago, our men and our campments traveled to address this treaty issue 
and to sign that treaty. But it was the women that they had spoken to because, you know, of the hard times our people were facing and we were eluding the Calvary and, and constantly in battle. And, you know, what did they want back then? What did those grandmas want is preservation of life. And so the men went forth and they signed the treaty. But does that make it okay today to say, well, it's only the men who will make decisions for us as women and our children? And so, you know, we as women, we also have a voice. We also have a right to speak on behalf of the Oyate and, oh, and, and our families. You know, we're the ones making decisions and taking care of our home and feeding our children and worrying about the bills and worrying about, you know, what's going to happen to our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And why is it that we come to a meeting and we have to we have to pay to come in and talk about these issues and talk about, you know, our culture and talk about treaty and and it shouldn't be that way. You know, I've I've been to some old treaty meetings. And I've heard my grandfather, Oliver Redcloud, talk about, you know, a lot of issues pertaining to Lakota and our way of life, education, roads, health care. And there was never a fee. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. people came together and they brought coffee, they brought meals, and, and women were there in those meetings. And those grandmas were most of the ones who talked. Mm -hmm. You know, and they told these grandpas and these men what they wanted, and they heard. They sat back and they listened because that was leadership. That leadership is when you sit back and you listen to the people and to everything they have to say. You don't judge them. You don't criticize them. You don't charge them. You don't make it about you and about how we're going to promote, you know, that leader. We make it about let's listen to everybody because everybody has a voice everybody's words are sacred and have meaning because we're spiritual beings. And so why is it today that we have to charge and we have to, and those of us that can't afford to go into those meetings, you know, there's a lot of Unshika people. There's a lot of people who can't afford that. And are we separating them? Are we making them feel bad because they don't have the money to go into this meeting and be a part of something as grand as let's meet and talk about what's going to happen to the Oyate. Well, I'm sorry you can't come in because we have guards up here and you can't come in because you don't have a When does it become about the monetary value of, of having to pay to go in and talk about what you want for your children and your grandchildren? That's a shameful thing. I feel bad because I know a lot of people feel bad. And it's sad that it's come to this. We're doing exactly what we were taught. And this isn't Wolokota. These are not Wolokota values because it doesn't feel right. And so I think that you know, we talk about unity. This isn't unifying all of us together. It's separation. And now we are becoming masters of internalized oppression. Mm -hmm. And we are oppressing each other. And we're making each other feel bad so that we feel good about whatever it is they're doing. And, you know, I've had to see where my, my husband here was never invited to a lot of these meetings. You know, I was taught by a lot of our elders that when you want a meeting of all of the people in the Oyate, you go kage, you take something, or you contact them, or you reach out to them and say, I need you to be here. When you go to medicine man, you take him tobacco, and you ask him, and you do it, there's protocol, there's procedure. When you ask a, a chief to come, and to be a part of something, you ask them in a good way. You don't say, oh, well, didn't you get the memo or didn't you get the email? No, it's not about that. It's taking the time to do it in a good way. And so I think that there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. And I think our people are too divided right now. And I think there's a lot of disconnection 
there's a lot of hurt feelings and emotions right now. And how do we overcome that? How do we come back together to really think about where we need to be in the future? And I, I, I remember a grandma telling me that she went to ceremony and they told her, it's time for the women to stand up. Stand up now, they said. Come together and start addressing these issues because we know what we want, we know what we need. We know what our children and our great-grandchildren are gonna need. Those are just some of my thoughts. Oh, that's, that, that's perfect. And, and you know, back, uh, yeah. back in the earlier days, um, the traditional people had many treaty meetings that I was invited to, and uh, we never had to pay that fee to get there. And uh, but now, a lot of the older people that were doing the treaty meetings are gone. And now, we see the IRA people running them. So they're the ones that are causing the hardship. Well, all the Oyantes, you know, by charging. I've never paid to get into this meeting, and I never will. You know, I'm thankful somebody paid my way this time to go in. But uh, myself, I, I will not pay. And you shouldn't have to, John. That's, I mean, I... I you know, I'm I'm coming from a, a generation that you know we've seen all of these traumas and and that systemic uh, racial that we hold against each other. You know, we have lateral violence. Um, you know, we racism each other. You, you know, I'm more Indian. I'm darker than you, or you're too light skinned or you know, you don't have enough braids. Or you can't braids. speak our language. You can't speak our language. And, and I mean, there's just all these things. If you were born from an indigenous mother, I feel you are indigenous. And and I, I don't know, you know, how these protocols and procedures came into play because, you know, it's 2021 and technology is moving and it's not, we're not going to go back. You know, we can talk about sovereignty. We can talk about um, the genocide, but we got to remember that we we can't move backwards. And we, I know I'm I'm not going to go and live in a teepee. I know I can, but I know I'm not going to walk to a location. I you know I'm going to drive a car, and hopefully it's a um, electric car you know we gotta start <laughs> sending for money to see if santa claus will bring us electric cars <laughs> but you know that that mindset is is there and we gotta move and grow with technology and and these these society and how these younger generations are coming up you know, you know i've seen my cousins and their kids and our our grandkids and they're in their phones our ipads are they in their games and and they're just disconnected and and there's nobody going outside you know we used to run and play along the creek from sun up till sundown and it was fun and there was no um you know now we have the mmiw i mean we have so much drugs and alcohol and um violence you know domestic violence, there's all these things that happen to our people because of that assimilation process that just, you know, when our kids grew up, you know, I, I grew up seeing that, you know, and our, our, our next generation is growing up seeing that and, and it's just getting worse. You know, how are we going to, that's, but those are the things that we need to be addressing in these, these treaty, treaty, um, conferences or treaty get-togethers, gatherings, because 
it's our own homes that we got to fix and we got to stop oppressing each other. And, and, you know, myself and my wife been together for 16 years. It's going to be 16 years in a couple of days. And we're celebrating um, 16 years. Um, yes. Yeah, that's that's uh, it's a long time. It's a long time, man. <laughs> but I, I know of some couples that have been together a lot longer, but they don't, none of them are on the reservations. And, and you know, I myself, me and my wife, we have been um, laterally violenced and gay bashed off of our own reservation, off of our own tribe. And we were gone for 10 years and we swore we would never come back. And, and you know, it, it took my mother back in 2016 to come and visit us. And she said, Muffy, I want you to come home now. You don't have to move back to the reservation, but move close because, you know, I'm not doing good and your dad's getting blind. And, and you know, these are real things that change a person. And, you know, that, that whole thing of me being upset about what people did to us, you know, in a gay bashing way, not, not, accepting same-sex couples you know i had to forgive those people on my own reservation in order to come back and be here for my mom and i was so happy i got to spend you know she she passed away in 2019 so i spent we came back in 2016 and spent three years you know you know really loving and blessed and we were prepared you know for when she she went but it took something like that to change my perspective and actually forgive our own people. And then during that whole time, we were still have, being contacted by other two spirits, not just from our tribe, but from all of the Ocheti Shakoi. And they wanted us to do something. So we did. You know, I quit my job and I went back and I asked the um, attorney general, what can we do? And he said, there's no laws for protection. And I said, well, well, how do I start? So he sent me on that path of what we have accomplished with the Ogallasu tribe, and that's enacting a protection law for LGBTQ Native Two-Spirit people for the Ogallasu tribe. We have, we have visited with Rosebud and the Sichangu tribe we got it through the Law and Order Committee, but we haven't gone back because COVID hit. Mm -hmm. How do you guys feel about the Two-Spirit people? Can I get your reaction on that? Just small and brief. Um, you know, that's... Um, I think that's something that every every tribe needs to pass something in support of them. And, uh, you know, hopefully Rosebud will do that for you and for the people on the Rosebud that are involved in that. But, you know, it's, it's everywhere on the reservation all the reservations, so it should be passed. Yeah, I agree. I also, um, you know, every time I, I hear that, it just reminds me of a time when I was sitting in ceremony and my grandpa was getting after these, these men because we had somebody in there who was lighter skinned and they were saying stuff and he came out and he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you better listen up. Tinkashala is in here, and he doesn't see what color of your skin is. He doesn't see what color your hair is. He sees what's in your heart, and he sees what's in your mind. And so, you know, as spiritual beings, and, and a lot of people forget that. They forget we have a spirit, that we need to honor that spirit. And if there's two spirits to one person, that makes it even more special. That makes it even more sacred. And they walk in a sacred manner. And we forget that. We forget that we need to honor those sacred things. And if those laws need to be changed or put in place, 
it, it's kind of disheartening that we have to do that because we should already know that. And that shouldn't even be a question. That shouldn't have to be something put from pen to paper. We should just automatically have that as a way of respect. You know, that, that was a question that was at, that we were asked when we were in Rome, Italy. And we were talking to a big group of people and they had questions for us and that was one of the questions and uh you know we just told them that's the way it is you know mm -hmm. they're accepted awesome man I, back 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 awesome. in the old days you know mm -hmm. they were accepted mm -hmm. but you know these new days there's all kinds of different things happening but it was accepted wow thank you thank for you. that wopila um that's powerful because uh, I know, uh, you know, when I was little, um, remember uh, Steve, um, and I don't want to call them medicine men, but you know, the nowadays uh, they're the healers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Steed, he he always used to come down for my grandpa. Um, he hunt hunk a big big owl, and uh, they'd come down. You know, my grandpa would ride out and he'd go over there and be gone for a couple of days, take him a couple of days to get there. And then, you know, he took his tobacco and everything and then he'd come back and he'd sit, you know, a couple other people would come in. And one of them was a, um, a lesbian woman, you know, and she dressed in, in pants and, and, and I was just little and, you know, then a, a trans uh male that dressed as a woman would come in and they would prepare the ceremony and then all the families would start coming and they'd set up the tents and then you know the the, the then they weren't known as two spirit you know they would call them a different name and i still can't remember that name i'm trying to you know all of my elders are gone from my family and um but they didn't treat them any different and and they were never laughed at in any way, or nobody said, ha, 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 that person is like that. Nobody said that in our family. And I I grew up, you know, knowing that that was respected with, within our whole Teoshpaye. And even, you know, and, and they came from, you know, I'm not, I don't know if they came from Robert's people first, but they did come in. You know, they came in and they prepared and then they'd go and get, they'd get the meat, you know, and they'd hunt and, you know, they would go and have us trapping uh, prairie dogs. You know, those ceremonies were done with prairie dogs too. And, and I mean, there's so much old stuff that we have to um, record and get down before it's lost because you tell that to, um, you know, 25-year-olds and 30-year-olds and they don't even know what you're talking about. But those ceremonies were done and prepared and those ceremonies were kept in a way for all of the people by, you know, two-spirit trans and, you know, lesbians and bisexuals and, and gay people. And I really didn't see um, my family treat or make fun of people like myself, you know, and, and I, I really honor and respect you for for saying that and especially when you went to Rome and, and you know you gave them that answer thank you on behalf of all of the two spirit throughout the state of South Dakota and whoever's listening to this this podcast yes. because that is uh that's correct Tamara we they should already have that in place but um you know there's I used to be a police officer on my reservation and and there's no laws and on Friday I'm hoping to get a piece of paper into Deb Holland's hand that addresses the elements of the crime for the Bureau of Indian Affairs police officers. You know, they need to be trained because there's so much violence on every reservation and gay bashing that they're not addressing the real issues and everybody's just kind of um, frosting that, that issue over and uh, we're going to put, 
you know, a piece of paper in her hand to see if she can address that within the whole regions of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that's awesome. And yes, I, I just enjoyed uh, having you two with us tonight. And, and I, I loved how, you know, how you did, uh, how you respected the two spirit in, in Rome. Um, I liked how you spoke about, you know, how our culture our needed women. to be or should be. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I just pray to Tonkashila every day and I smudge every day, every morning, me and my wife, we get up, we smudge, we go to bed, we smudge, but we pray about uniting everybody coming together and being united and working together and not having that division. So, uh, you know, we're from the Oglala, <laughs> your um, rosebuds, and I'm glad that we're able to have these conversations and hopefully we can all come together again and have more conversations like this where we can all, you know, work with each other. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And thank you for having us. It is real an honor to be amongst all of you and, and, um, I really want to lift you up and, and let you know that, you know, uh, my wife and I, we we really respect you. And, and, and I know uh, we didn't have your phone number. We have them now. <laughs> and um, so what we originally do, you know, we always give tobacco and um, the sage, the cedar, the sweet grass the bitter root and uh, we gave that offering to, to the chief and, and we thank you with all our heart and we look forward to always having this connection and, and lifting each other up and however we can help you, we are right here and however we can uplift each other if you're going through something and, and if we have connections you need, always reach out to us and that door is open and you know, we have some things coming up for the Senate, and I know um, it's always good to support our Indigenous legislation. You know, we we have this redistricting that's that happened, and now we're going to be stuck with that map, and it opened up a lot of things, and we may lose that Indigenous seat at the state level. So however we can help each other during the voting, let us know. You know, we have, we're involved with a lot of different organizations and we'll darn sure try to assist if, if you guys need help with anything at all. And um, we look forward to keeping this going because I know I talked to John about this upcoming water meeting, you know, during the um, stock shows, we'll probably try to put it on the stock show. So, cause I know he's going to be riding Bronx there, he said. So. <laughs> He'll have to check his schedule. <laughs> but Wopila, if you Wopila. if you have any closing, if you guys want to tell the people about this and what you want to get out there for the holidays, the Bigfoot rides. I, I think I'd like to remind everybody to be mindful of your family. Also, find forgiveness. And those people that have hurt you or said something about you, um, be careful what you say because you could hurt somebody and you could hurt their heart. And try to be respectful to all walks of life. And what, most of all, importantly, remember to prayer. pray and, and walk your prayers. And for those of you listening out there, you know, you're not alone, and there are people out there that care about you and love you, and reach out to them, and be good to one another. You know, in your prayers, you know, you always pray for your family and relatives, the way out these. You know, you have to remember to pray for our Mother Earth here. In our money, the water, the medicine, and even the air, everything's becoming contaminated now. And these viruses that are coming now, nowadays, they're going to continue to come. You know, I, 
I never thought I'd ever see this happen with this COVID. But we knew things like this would happen. And our younger generation, our kids and our grandkids are going to experience it more than us. But, you know, all the people need to pray about it and ask for Rachel for everything. Okay, we'll be back here in about two minutes uh, with Crystal Tubles from Indian Collective.
Good afternoon. I mean, good evening. Um, we just got done with a couple of them, and here we are. And uh, I'm so happy and honored to be sitting amongst what is called the Land Back Crew. And we are here with the Indian Collective. I am uh, Monique. Muffy Muso Chanupa Maniwi walks with the pipe woman. I am from the Uniting Resilience uh, Organization. Um, and I'd like to, Chuck told me, don't just be like this. So I'm going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm here with uh, Crystal, and I'd like for her to go ahead and introduce her um, team. And I'm really honored, and I really thank you. And I say Wopila Tanka from the bottom of my heart for having you be here tonight yeah. to go ahead and take it away. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mopi. Um, well, Peveshev uh, relatives, uh, uh, my name's Crystal Tubles. I'm Oglala Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, uh, raised in Northern Cheyenne Territory in Montana, but enrolled Oglala Lakota here in South Dakota. Um, and in, I'm the director of the Land Back Campaign with Indian Collective. And I'll, I'll hand it over to my team and let them introduce themselves and, and their roles too. Hello, everyone. Yate. It's a good day to be indigenous. <laughs> I wanted to say, I don't know. I just, it's like a very official like setup, and I just want to be like my John Trudell moment. But, um, <laughs> Hello, Yate. She Demetrius Johnson, Dasha Jinne, Turachini initially, Ada Sidna Jinni, Bashashin, Sanji Kene, Disha Che, Ada Turachini, Additionella. My name is Demetrius Johnson. I'm Dene. I come from a community called Twithlane, which is near Granado, Arizona. And yeah, I'm a land back organizer. Ahlan, Masa al Khair, Isminat Yatanus, Abu Iman Yafa, who led, was led for Mahaya Mishnallar, for Marka. Oh, Emmy, men, Irlanda, men, County Cavan, Eribel Hadud, Northern Ireland. Um, and I led it for Oakland, California, for Shatat. Um, Hi, good, good evening. My name is Nadia Tonnus. My father is Palestinian from the villages of Yaffa and Lid. My mother is Irish from County Cavan, five minutes from the border with Northern Ireland. I was born in exile in Oakland, California. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Oh, and I'm a Lembeck organizer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to start by saying, you know, we, we um, came to this meeting. We had a meeting on Monday and we had the opportunity to see uh, Nick's presentation down in um, the Great Plains uh, Tribal Water Alliance over in uh, Ramcota. And uh, I, I was really um, proud and, and it was very informational. And I, I feel our, our tribes have to, you know, step outside of their... Um, fighting you know there's so much um internal violence on every reservation you know it's not just like that for the ocheti shakoni i know outside of mm. south dakota every tribe you know the navajo and and, and northern cheyenne mm -hmm. uh we all have the same growing pains and and we all have that um you know violencing within the iras but we all need to come together and and try to unify you know, that's a big, big thing that, you know, we're uniting resilience. We're tr we know we all came through the door after, you know, some of us maybe got education. Some of us maybe have a lot of good experience, but we came through that door and all of us have, have wounds. Mm -hmm. All of us come with scars. All of us come, you know, um, limping and hurt. And some of us have, have healed ourselves and are trying to help our people to come together for these issues. And, and I know, you know, Indian Collective, you know, I really um, take pride in, in knowing um, Nick and, mm -hmm. and understanding that he's on this, this journey to also try to unite our, our IRA governments and our treaty uh, councils and and that's 
that's a slippery slope to, you know, we're, we're in it with, with the water issues and, you know, the two spirit issue, you know, tell us a little bit about how you're feeling with the unifying within the treaty and the IRAs. How are you coming about with your land back campaign? Yeah. I mean, so there, there's several different things there. Um, you know, we, my team and I, you know, we lead the land back campaign, but land back is, um, it's many different things, mm -hmm. you know, and it's land back is, you know, it's um, literal reclamation of land, our literal, literal rematriating, like reclaiming our relationship to the land, you know, us mm -hmm. going back to the land. Um, and so I think, you know, that's what it is, but it, it's also, you know, we, we were fully thriving economies and societies and communities pre-colonization and in land back also represents the reclamation of everything stolen from us when we are forced to remove from those lands the destruction of those economies and those societies and those communities and so that means land back is also reclaiming language and ceremony and culture and spirituality it's reclaiming you know it's reclaiming food systems and education systems housing systems um you know all of these things healthcare systems mm -hmm. It's all of that. It's the reclamation of all of these things that was all rooted and based on our relationship to Mother Earth and to the land. And so for us, that's that's how we move as a campaign is that's for, first and foremost is we're we're trying to reclaim our relationship. And we're also, you know, like where I'm from, like we have songs that teach us. And I grew up hearing these words in ceremony that we are the land. And so for, for me, the way that we're trying to carry this is like, that means in reclaiming our relationship to the land, we're also reclaiming ourselves and in speaking about healing, like that leads to healing. And so, you know, that's the work that we hold with the campaign, but land back. So it's that work, you know, and it, it's also a meta narrative. It's this massive narrative similar to Black Lives Matter, right? That houses so much organizing and organizations and organizers and individuals and grassroots people and, um, you know, collectives or individual, all of those, right? People that, that want to just be back in relationship with the land. And so it's a meta narrative, but it's, it's also, you know, it's a movement. And Land Back is a movement that has existed since the first settlers stepped foot on our lands. And so us as a team and as a campaign, we're just stepping into this work that has been going on for generations and for generations. And so it's it's not new work. Mm -hmm. We're just stepping into it in its new iteration of what the struggle looks like right now. And in doing this work, we're, you know, we're we're young people that are learning still you know, like still really deeply learning and, and trying to hold, and I would say my generation specifically, because both Nadia and Dee are younger than myself, but, you know, I've always felt like I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm like the bridge generation between our elders and older um, relatives that carry, um, that carry our, our knowledge and our traditions and our language and those things. And then our youth who are, you know, have been disconnected from that. And so I feel like my generation is like this this bridge that has to connect so connect those things. But also my dad always talks about how like unfortunately because of colonization like a lot of our elders are also close to the original trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then it's flipped because our young people are more distanced from that trauma in doing that healing work and reconnecting. So it's like, you know, these these dynamics that exist, we're constantly navigating them and figuring them out. And I think like right now what I'm what we're working on is um, a land trust, what would be called the Ochati Shakoi Nation Land Trust. And that's just a proposed name. It's, you know, it may or may not be what it ends up actually being called, but it, it's what we're thinking about. Like, how do we, you know, the biggest issue with trying to reclaim the Black Hills is the fact that there is, you know, in terms of like the way the government is thinking about it, there's no legal entity to give the land back to. Mm -hmm. Because we can't get the land all back to one individual tribe. Because mm -hmm. that would create infighting. And so, you know, that's, that's something we've been thinking deeply about, you know, of like, how do we honor what our elders are teaching us and, and sharing with us and passing down 
but also how do our younger generation who see these opportunities of how to move forward, how do we bridge those things and connect those things? And so with this land trust, the proposal is, is Section 17 Corporation, which is like a tribal corporation. And that has to have secretarial approval, which means Secretary Deb Holland has to be the one to approve this, this land trust. But what we're proposing is that all of the um, Acheti Shakoi Nation tribes, and so far there's 16, you know, that we're that we're seeing in terms of proximity to the Black Hills, right? Um, and so we are proposing that they come in with equal ownership of this corporation, where all of these tribes who are often pitted against each other because scarcity was introduced to us because mm -hmm. of colonization, where they have equal say in in management of the black hills and the goal would be for this corporation to exist and then for us to be able like are that entity to be able to petition for co-management of the black hills not because co-management is land back because it's not it's it's how we open the door to get land back so my question is sorry to interrupt you yeah but, no um that's kind of getting a seat at the table yeah. With the National Forest Service, with the National Park Service, with all those uh, different organizations that run the Black Hills now. Yeah. I mean, I would say, yes, it's getting a seat at the table Why we simultaneously build our own table over here. Okay. <laughs> Where you. we have full say. Right. Because co-management is not the end game. It is only the first step. It's just one singular step simultaneously though what we're saying is like we don't want to ask for co-management of anything we don't want to have to ask permission and still be operating under this but we also are strategic people mm -hmm. you know like i myself and even if you ask nadia and d like you know we all descend from from our ancestors mm -hmm. like i myself descend from chief gull you know on my kubo side i i descend from chief man afraid of his horse and and my dad is one of Council of 44 Chiefs for the Northern Cheyenne. And Gaul was a master strategist. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we we are utilizing those things that were passed down to us and then our knowledge that we have now to think about like, well, what is the strategy? I'm also a veteran. And so when I think about these things, like we do not fight battles on just one front. Like we, we fight all of these battles so we can win this overarching war. Awesome. And so like we have to fight on every single possible front and co-management is one front, one single front, why we are simultaneously doing all of this other work in all the other ways of reclaiming land back because the end goal is where the federal government has no say over how we are in relationship to our lands. And we build that relationship back how we were taught to and how our ancestors told us. And so that's like, that's how the co-management fits into there's just one little step and just open the door. Let's sit at this table for a bit while we're building our, our table over here, how we want it to be. Wow. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Holy smokes. And, and, and I hope these viewers are, are listening and, and understanding that, you know, and if you have any questions, put them in the chat or get a hold of uh, Crystal or any of her team, Demetrius and... Nadia, um, I really, really think that this is a pivotal um, moment in, in our IRA governments and our treaty consuls and how you're going to navigate through that. And, and Uniting Resilience would like to, uh, you know, support you in that because uh, I think that's important for, for all of our people and and you're not not our generation yet, but I see, you know, we've gone through um, the tribe, the IRA governments, and, and we just recently started, you know, navigating through the treaty, treaty councils, and there's so much division. There's mm. so much division. I don't know if you're, you're um, experiencing that yet, but you're gonna, and, and, um, I, I have done nothing but try to get that out there that how we're going to come together in unity because we have to and addressing these types of issues, you know, 
land is one, water is mm-hmm. another one, air. You know, we were just talking to Chief Spotted Tail and, mm-hmm. and he told every part of it, you know, and, and there's even more sacredness to to not just the land, air, and the water. You know, we have our four-legged, mm-hmm. we have our plant nation, we have our insect nation, and those things are real. I mean, mm-hmm. those are the the other things we haven't even addressed yet and that's coming you know that's probably coming in your generation Mm -hmm. i'm gonna be i'm gonna be that super elder and you're (laughs) gonna be saying hey you know so but yeah i'd like to hear from from you guys if if you would like to talk a little bit about your experience on on this journey you know with with the indian collective and how how exciting you 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 are to address these issues with with the tribes and our people i guess i'll go first um well first of all like it's always been an honor to to come to come to these lands these aren't my lands i mean i'm a long ways from home being like a dinette person (laughs) um but it's seriously like an honor to 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 be a good relative and to try to help um my lakota relatives who in in Northern Cheyenne and the other tribes like try to reclaim their own sacred sites. Um, but one thing that, you know, this is my first ever uh, treaty council meeting ever. And I was, you know, it's, it's, for me, it was, it, I mean, obviously it's like a huge honor to be invited, but also like, I've noticed like a lot of similarities that from these meetings and also meetings from like my own, my own community at the chapter house level or at the um, like the council level, but I guess like those, those, the similarities of just like elders talking, always opening up with prayer. Um, and also just kind of just like, um, I don't know what, for lack of a better word, like, <laughs> like beef or just like, you know, just some of like the, the, the differences of opinion that happens within these meetings. Um, and there's, and, and um, I do anticipate pushback, which is good, um, but also like, I guess like being like a younger person, but also growing up like, you know, around chapter house meetings and growing up like an environment where like, it's just always like a process or it's like always like a very slow process to get something done. There's always conversation. There's always elders talking. There's always just like history like being had. And I understand like those conversations are very important um, and I respect them because there's a lot of history that is shared but also like, I guess like within the context of where our world is now, um, it does feel like a little bit um, frustrating or like there's, there's, a, there's a sense of anxiety of just like, well, we you know we have to come up with solutions now and um, we do need to like kind of just cut it out. Like, <laughs> like there's, I mean, I mean, there's like a time, there's a time and place for everything, but me like traveling to other indigenous communities all over the world um, specifically to like Palestine or even um, being introduced to our relatives down like in South America, they are like really holding it down and they are really going hard um, to protect their lands and reclaim their lands. Um, and it's to the point where like they're, they're, they're literally like fighting their government, specifically like U.S. imperialism every single day um, to survive. And so when you see that from other communities around the world and then you look at us like I'll, I'll just talk about my own my own my own tribe um it gets frustrating it's like wow like we have relatives everywhere like fighting the us and here we are fighting each other um and that's like the frustrating thing because we are in the belly of the beast uh, we are within the us and everywhere else in the world is fighting the us but here we are fighting ourselves um and just like that internationalist approach, just like us, like just me, like making connections and, um, you know, with, with, with other people across the world, like it's, it gets frustrating. Um, especially as a young person, I'm, I mean, I'm old, but also young. I don't know. I'm 27, but just, (laughs) just having like these experiences and me also wanting to share that with, with, with my own communities and other communities, like, yo, like, Believe it or not, like other people are depending on this, on us. Um, and this uh, co-management, um, like Crystal said, like it isn't the 
it isn't the end all be all. This is only the first step, but at the same time, it's, it is, it is historic and it's huge. Um, and you know, just, you know, what, what I bring to the table, like, I'm just, I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to be a good relative. And I think that's just, you know, how we're going to win. Um, because the world needs us. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think for myself, um, I'm the first generation born here on Turtle Island. Um, and my parents came, they met in the 80s um, in the Bay Area, and that's on the Lonely Territory. Um, and that's where I'm born and raised. So it's been an interesting experience for somebody from, um, fortunately, alhamdulillah, two really strong traditions um, and to be raised by my grandparents. Um, and my family was really um, a, a privilege that I think um, it's our right, but it's also something that pretty close in my bloodline, they were not able to have. And so I've been lucky that even growing up far away from home and being uh, kept apart from my home by settler colonialism, by the state of Israel, by U.S.-backed uh, imperialism, um, that I've been able to find my root. And I think um, I find myself in, in this work because, um, like what Demetrius said, I think it's my responsibility to be Palestinian for me isn't just to show up for my own people. It's to live our values um, every day and to fight for what's right, where we are for the people around us. And it's about relationships. So, um, yeah, also thank you for having me on your lands and on your territory. Um, we all are free people. You know, we should be free people and free to roam and walk the earth and you know, borders are crap, but also I don't think that we always have the right to go wherever we want. And the type of um, American exceptionalism that's given to us, we can just roam wherever, anything's ours, whatever you want. You know, it is it is um, a privilege that I'm able to be here in relationship with the people um, and not just as some form of tourism, to example, Mount Rushmore, um, which I think I circle back to because there's so much violence in that monument to the United States government, to white supremacy, to, um, you know, and it's it's something that we look at as those of us who are the heirs of colonialism, right? And also um, the ones who will win that back. You know, it's my role only to support what is inevitable it's inevitable that the land returns to the people because the land knows us. The place that we come from knows who we are and we know the land like nobody else does. And so I think here are some of the lessons um, that I've really learned. It's also my first treaty council meeting is that we, the beautiful thing about this work is that we have to work together in order to get things done. Mm -hmm. The tough thing, but also maybe the beautiful thing where we learn through it is that we parse through all the different layers of the things that our elders have gone through. You know, I can also speak in my own community, you know, going, you know, trying to um, create a different present than the one that we have, which can be very painful, is also about kind of unearthing sometimes the um, mistakes of the past or things that people feel are failure the jadedness of our elders who thought that they were going to win that one fight and win again and win again, but instead they've been um, torn down. Mm -hmm. And trying to really be humble but also pragmatic about what we have been able to build. We're still here. That's enough for me. Mm -hmm. So to be able to fight and say, yes, we didn't win, in our case, the Battle of El Karame. Most everybody in that battle was massacred from my side but we still hearken it as a massive battle because all of those people who fought, they went in knowing that they were going to die. But in that, they sacrificed themselves for our consciousness. And it worked. It changed the ethos of our struggle. From there, we have so many wins because they made that ultimate sacrifice. And here, we're lucky that we're talking about a battlefield 
that very much, as one of the elders said earlier, these treaties are written in blood. They're written under duress, but they're also written under by people who strategized, thought about their people, thought about longevity. And so what does it mean to inherit also that um, that history, that um, that legacy? And what do we do now in 2021? What are we capable of doing? We are capable of working with each other. We are capable of being reflexive, of being reflexive about the ways that um, we might sabotage one another out of fear, out of love. But we're also capable to, of choosing. Mm -hmm. Doing this step is a choice. No one's gonna push folks to do it. No one's gonna push um, the Lakota, Dakota, the Nokota, the Oshatisha Cohen. No one's gonna push you mm -hmm. to do this. This is your choice. This is your destiny. But I think what's you know, really, um, again, inspiring about doing this work is that I know that the intentions are very clear. The intentions are to get the land back into the hands of the people. In the land trust, nowhere does it say that Indian Collective will be at the seat, uh, it will be in a seat at the table, or will be in charge, or will be dictating uh, or leading any of the decisions. That is specifically for the tribes, that is specifically for the people. And so I think, um, I, I hope that it will be um, something that folks can be proud of. And I look forward to seeing um, the rightful people, you all, be able to actually formulate, build, inform, deliberate, argue if you need to, right? In order to make something, a final product, that it's a small step, but it's a necessary step. We all are strategists. We know you can't go forward without taking one step and the next step. It has to be there. And so if you can wedge something into the door, what is the most genuine form? What is the best way that we can move forward? This is a proposal. This is a pragmatic proposal to make material gains, to get the lamb back into indigenous hands. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what happens and I know the terrain ahead is going to be tough, but I do. I believe in y'all. I really do. Wow. Thank you. And I just want to uh, give a shout out to Dimitri and his, um, all of his fine. Oh, uh, my bling. <laughs> your bling, bling. I kind of want you to put up your hand like this. Uh, that is pretty. The turquoise is off the charts and he's got a really good necklace on and. He said he was old. He feels old and he's 27. I know. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh, like like little, that was like a pop. Okay. Little baby. Child I, I will I will say Pretty though, bad. like <laughs> I I specifically wore this to kind of just like let let all the Lakotas know, like, hey, hey. we got a Danette person in, in the house oh right God. now. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Hold it up. Send, send him home. <laughs> I feel like Thanos, like, just like I, I, I gathered all oh the infinity stones. And and that's that's awesome. And that brings us to, to what I really want to um, talk about is, and you know, you're, you're a huge organization, the Indian Collective, you know, in the guidance of uh, Nick, you know, and you touched on some stuff. Each one of you touched on a lot of good information and, and um, you know, you got really young youth coming in and, you know, we're a young um, organization starting, you know, in, in two-spirit uh, protections throughout our Ocheti Shakoi. And then, you know, we're going to probably, and we've been asked by numerous other tribes on Turtle Island, so we will probably go out to them as soon as we can. And I know we're going to help each other in every way because what we ultimately, ultimately need to get that message out, and I know all of you will agree that this is not a competition mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form. And we got to start, you know, letting our people know that stop competing. Stop competing if you're a male, a female, if you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, you know, if you're disabled. If you're a veteran, you know, if you're you're anything, we 
we are not, we should not be in competition. What we need to be doing is focusing on saving Mother Earth mm. and, and always understanding that we were the first people here. And, and you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, I don't want to say indigenous anymore. So that that's kind of going out. But we were totally indigenous to this land prior to any um, first contact in the 1400s, you know, when the, the Nina, the mm -hmm. Pinta, and the Santa Maria touched board over there on the East Coast. And, and it's good. And I hope that we all know our histories from each of our tribes and our people. And, and it's powerful what we're all trying to accomplish. And, you know, it's going to be hard with the IRAs with, you know, cause I already, me, I grew up saying because of my grandpa and my great grandpa and grandma's is Takoja. Always remember the Hisapa, the black kills are not for sale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I came through 4-H, you know, grade school, high school, college, and extra college, you know, I don't like school, but I encourage school. But um, in my dormitory at, at college, anywhere, even when I was in high school in my room, I have a sign that says the Black Kills are not for sale. Mm -hmm. I always have that. You come mm -hmm. to our house right now, even when we lived in New Mexico, even when we lived in North Dakota, and I've gotten into it with our landlords mm -hmm. for having that sign that says the Black Kills are not for sale. And my landlord has come and torn it, tore it down a few mm -hmm. times, but I put it right back up. Mm -hmm. You know, freedom of speech. You know, they have their Trump flags out. I can have my the Black yeah. Hills are not for sale out. So I just want you to understand that there's all those old mentality navigations that you're going to experience mm -hmm. because there's that old, old school that they really do not trust there's a lot of mistrust and there's all that in-depth assimilation from the boarding schools and that Bible really uh, assimilated many, many indigenous families. And, and I know that you're going to have a hard time and however we can help you, Uniting Resilience, we support you. Mm -hmm. And we want to always maintain a connection of, of moving forward and Nowhere should we ever be in competition for each other other than you guys giving us as much money as you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. if uh, you would like to um, discuss a little bit about, um, I know we've had, and I'm going to ask everybody this and, and how you feel about Two-Spirit. Yeah, no, I think that's valid. I think one of the the one of the um well first thank you for offering your support mm -hmm. i mean i think that's that's major i think um our campaign when we were developing our campaign in in as i when when we brought nadia and dion some of the first things i told them was like we are a relationships based campaign and and that is how we're going to win is through our relationships and and i say that because we as a strategist <laughs> but also as a human like we want to always ma maintain those human relationships and and i think that's that's the cornerstone of any kind of win that has ever happened is relationship mm -hmm. and uniting and having mm -hmm. united fronts in that way and i think that means for all of our peoples um and just in terms of your question of how i feel about that I mean, I think like we are all relatives when we say those things and we have to live by that of what that really means. But I also think that brings into question is like decolonizing and, and what that means to really decolonize, right? Mm -hmm. Because our relatives, our LGBTQ relatives have always existed, have always been part of our communities, have always held sacred places and positions in our communities. And so I think like we have to honor that as we do all of our spirits and all of the peoples that we're in relationship to. And so, I mean, that's definitely how, how I hold that with every relationship. They, there's power as we come together and as we do this work together and as we unite. Um, so I think first and foremost, that's, yeah, that's how we hold our relationships that way. And that's how we win. And that's, that's how we heal 
that's how we decolonize, right? Like for me, we were having this conversation the other night of like um, decolonizing for me means like, mm. <laughs> I was saying, I said it in such a weird way, but I was like, it means the undoing of what colonization did forward. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like, I like, got it. Yep. yeah. Yep. And so I, you know, and I think that's, that's what it is. So it's, re it's reclaiming these relationships. It's reclaiming those roles in our communities. It's reclaiming that but what does that look like moving forward, right? Because we know we can't go back to this, but we also know what is possible because we come from this. And so that's what decolonization is. Um, and so that that is how our relatives fit into what we're doing. That is how we are all working together. That is how we move forward. That is how we win. Um, and then when we win the Black Hills and we reclaim that relationship, that is how our Palestinian relatives will reclaim their lands. That is how all of our relatives in, in the Hawaiian kingdom in Glasgow, you know, in, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, all of these places, that is how they will reclaim their lands too, is because we will be in relationship to each other. We will be healing together and we'll be honoring those relationships and we will be decolonizing as we're going forward. Um, but yeah, that's how I hold that personally and, and hopefully as a campaign <laughs> as we go forward. Right on, thank you for that, Crystal. Would you guys like to also answer that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have, I mean, we have like the net people also have like their own like gender identities and we call like our LGBTQ2 plus relatives. Um, and there's two, there's two words for it. So there's Dilpa and then there's also Naglehe. Um, but for me growing up, like I was taught like the, these people like have very special sacred roles within our communities. Um, things that I can't do, things that you know, like cis women can't do. Like they, 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 they are they. They, I, I can't even hold hold a candle to them. Um, but of course, like um, you know, you know, you know, beyond that, you, just just in my experience, like organizing since since I've been organizing. Um, I'm also a part of a an organization um, called the Red Nation, but you know we have we, we do have like a lot of um, LGBTQ LGBTQ two plus relatives in our org, um, and a lot of the resistance efforts um, have been led by um, two spirit people, queer people, um, but also there's like a long history of like um, you know you know our our, our two spirit relatives being in the front towards our liberation efforts, and they should always be in the front. Um, leading our leading our um, liberation efforts, um, whether that's land back or whether that's um, anti imperialism, whether that's just um, you know anything anything that anything that we do um, resisting colonialism because that's that's what that's what um, colonization taught us is like that like our relatives are not our relatives, mm. um, mm -hmm. but you know like I don't know I've been. <laughs> They have a they have a whiteboard here. It says um, unity, and I think that's very true. And also, it's just like true to like something that 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 I always say too. It's just you know, one team, one dream. Um, apes together, strong. Like we 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 blitz all night. Like we like, we don't we we get there together. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So I obviously am in alignment, or not obviously, I am in alignment, hopefully obviously, if you <laughs> know our work and if you know um, what we're doing or attempting to do. Um, with what Crystal and Dimitri has said, I think it's really important to state that about, right, if land back is about um, the return of everything that's stolen, mm. it has to be also about kinship. Yep. And so I think that's at the center of um, relationships at the center of lands as, as the convener. It's the center of what we do, you know. Um, everything we could ever hope for um, is that repair. And so um, from my own uh, context as a Palestinian woman, as a Palestinian organizer, um, and coming from a grassroots movement called the Palestinian Youth Movement, um, and the recent birth of the Palestinian Feminist Collective, we really talk about how the violence of the state is gendered violence. And so when we talk about the empowering of women, we're talking about um, the empowering of all genders. 
Um, and I think that's really important when we think about the way that patriarchy and misogyny, capitalism, different forces of exploitation, they take and they take from the people that they want to dominate, which are women and two-spirit, but they also take in a very different way from our men. Awesome. Batteries ran out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. We lost um, batteries. battery connections. But, yeah. We're back. So if you want to finish up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just um, the understanding that these systems exploit women and two-spirit people first. Um, we are the first to be sacrificed um, by the mm -hmm. state. And as oppression becomes larger than us um, in the worst of times, and as it seeps into our communities, which is a part of disenfranchisement, we become the victims for it internally too. And I think what we know now, um, but also that it sacrifices our men by taking away purpose, right? And I think, um, what we can do, um, our, I was, you know, what I've been taught by some really brilliant um, people, you know, um, and what I've learned over the years as, you know, I'm transitioning from youth organizing into being whatever that next step is. It's a semi-adult, is that okay? Pseudo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pseudo, <laughs> right? But as we get older and we live these experiences, I think one thing I've learned from my community and from the amazing women, um, and in my case, less visible two-spirit organizers mm -hmm. or queer organizers, we would say, in the Palestinian context, before us, they would say, you have to fight for the homeland first, and then we fight for the internal contradictions. Because you're 30 years from colonialism, right, from the initial occupation. So yeah, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on that's an oppressive and terrible, and people are starving, dying of cholera, dying of influenza, right? There's a lot happening. And so you fight for the homeland. But now, as we're 70 years from initial colonization occupation in our case, we say there is no free homeland without free women. And that's important because it means that we can't wait Maybe at the time when we could have won, maybe that was the wisdoms that they're coming from. But now we're 70 years out. We're living in a temporary, in a situation that's supposed to be temporary, 
Our generations are being born in camps that were tents when my father was young. And now they're huge buildings with no running water and no sewage system. And you have three, four generations born in that situation. We can't wait. We can't wait to deal with our internal contradictions. And it doesn't make us weaker for having them. But the thing is, when we talk about no free homeland without free women, we're talking about our queer relatives and our queer people too. We're talking about all of us. Because when we're talking about the state, we're also taking on misogyny and patriarchy that has been influenced by those powers. And again, it's not to say that we're a perfect people. We don't have our own things. But it's also rejecting the um, belittling right, of those who are occupying us. So it's easy for the West to say, oh, those Arabs, those Muslims, those Palestinians, you know, they've always hated their women. They've always hated their children. And that's Orientalism, right? You take our power, you take our land, you have jealousy of the way that we can live together and be collective, the way that our lives are or were, and what we can be. You're scared of our power. But I can tell you first and foremost that the biggest thing that oppressed me as a Palestinian woman was the war on terror and was US militarism in terms of the patriarchy that we have in our community, in terms of the gendered violence that we have in our community. That is, um, that is um, those are things that we need to be able to take on on our own. And that primarily means being a free people first. Right. We need our freedom as people first. Trust me after that, we will take care of our own. And we are, but we can't, we're, we can't fight. We sh basically in this stage, just to finish off, we are not just rejecting and confronting the power of the people who hope to quiet us, the hope to um, subdue us. We're also fighting the narrative that we are not capable of ruling ourselves, that we are not capable of dealing with our own internal issues, that we are not powerful enough. We know that there's fear. That's the fear of the colonizer. They're afraid of our power. And so we're also fighting back the Western narrative to say that we are uncivilized or we're just like animals or in the Israeli context, actually, that we're flora and fauna. Um, we're people, and we're imperfect. But guess what? We know ourselves best. And trust me, in terms of our fight as Palestinians, it's women to the front. We have some wonderful men. But the people at the front of the fight are young women, are young queer Palestinians, period. It's our time. So we don't need an invitation. We're already here. <sighs> wow, Nadia, that just gave me chills. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I, I really want everybody that's listening to this, to, and, and hopefully there's um, indigenous natives listening here in, in Turtle Island. That's a perspective from somebody from the outside of a, a reservation, a uh, tribe, and um, you know, I I high five her and and I lift her up because you know every one of us that was born on these prison camps, you know, like the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, the Flanju Tribe, the Yankton, uh, or I should call them by their Lakota names, and our Dakota, Nakota, the E Hunkpati, the Hunktonian and the uh, Hunkpapa and the uh, Sisatonian Wapton and the uh, Oglala Lakota, the Sichangu. Um, Minikoju, the Kuwichasha. Uh, and I, I, I think I might have forgot when I was counting them on my little bitsy fingers. But um, thank you for, for pointing that out because what I want to say about that is, you know, I, I competed in, in, you know, basketball, rodeo, 
And, you know, I competed with uh, men in the same category. And when, when I won first place, I didn't make the m amount that the male mm -hmm. won. And I want to point that out. You know, I'm a little bit, quite a bit older than you are. And you're looking at a perspective and that's what, what, you know, that's that Me Too movement. That's that, um, you know, these sports women are standing up and, you know, saying, how come we didn't get the same pay, you know, in, in college rodeo for her cripe sakes here. And, you know, I went to quite a few college rodeos here in South Dakota and, you know, the, the men were, they would make more than the women, even in college rodeo. And the women basketball NBA players, they don't make as much as the men. You know, down here in this these treaties, I'm not just going to point out this treaty conference meeting. I'm going to point out all the treaty conferences. You know, they, you said that word, and, and I need to touch on it a little bit misogynistic men in these um, positions that that are dictating and and you know um, Tamara uh, look, looks back or stands looking back mm -hmm. spotted tail she had pointed that out too earlier you know how it's not equal yet and and I really um, I really honor and respect what Nick is trying to accomplish within his own organization as far as, uh, and I hope he is, as far as equality, you know, and and bringing these issues to the table and to talk about them. You know, he said something in our meeting on Monday night that, you know, it's not just going to be uh, males in, in these positions. Mm -hmm. He wants both genders yep. represented, you know, and I hope he also includes... Uh, you know, nobody should be uh, discriminated against if, if I put in for that position, mm -hmm. you know, and I myself, mm -hmm. I, I stand strong with the LGBTQ, mm -hmm. you know, two-spirit people. And, and so I really, really appreciate you bringing all of that, that up. And, and like I said, I do support you. And I'd like to turn it to uh, Crystal and to tell us in, in a closing, and each one of you will get a couple minutes of closing, but if you want to say anything more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I'll, I'll just wrap up with, uh, um, you know, like where, where folks can find our work and stuff. But before I go there, I just want to say um, thank you for, for having us and, and pulling us here. You know, we were, we were pretty tired from all day sitting at a treaty council and food and whatnot, but this feels like a really uh, rejuvenating conversation. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, also just to say too, that like, our, our people are traumatized and as we're healing, um, I just read this somewhere, probably on Facebook or something, but it <laughs> said uh, sometimes the healing process is more painful than the actual trauma. Yeah. And I, I think like I, I, that really hit me because I see our people like that. And, and so trying to find how do we have grace and compassion, but also hold our people accountable and, and try to move forward at the same time. And it's hard. And, you know, we have to do that together and we have to, like, do our best to reflect on those things as we're going. And I think that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, just sitting there listening to our elders and hearing things like sometimes that we're talking about, as Nadia said, reminds them of, of what didn't work mm -hmm. and, and all the pain and the trauma that came. And, and we have to honor that, you know, and, and have grace and compassion and understanding and um, still do the work. Like we still move forward yeah. and, um, you know, just thinking about that, something that's like really, you know, that I'm holding right now in this moment of trying to move forward with this land trust. But in terms of land back stuff, you know, I'll wrap up here is just, you know, we, we don't have public meetings right now, but I, I love that idea. But I will say over this next year, we will be doing deep canvassing here in the community. We really want to build relationship um, amongst each other, amongst our white neighbors, because however you do that, like we still live here together. Mm -hmm. We're still in these communities together. And, and we want to build that. We need to build together. And even if people aren't against us, like how do we move them to be for us? You know, if they are against us, how do we at least move them to just like 
be in the middle somewhere, you know? And so trying to deepen that work. So we'll be, we'll be calling for canvassers and people to do that work, to build relationship. We're going to be having community meals with folks and just like sitting and having these conversations mm -hmm. and just explaining what we're actually trying to do with Indian Collective, you know, all the way from land back campaign to our foundation team, you know, like what are we doing? And we want to have those conversations in our community with the people. Um, and we'll be hitting up powwows and just like sitting with the aunties and the uncles and the unchis and mm -hmm. get -es and everyone, you know, and just, and just trying to build together and build relationship. Um, and so, you know, this whole next year, we'll be coming out with a lot of things like that. So I would just say, um, you know, we're on landback.org or indiancollective.org. You can follow either one of those and, and keep up to date on what, what the Landback team is doing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah um, I know, I always, always look for approval. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, like um, this Landback work is beautiful. And, you know, just, just, just for, uh, you younger, younger folks. Um, but then I don't know, it's like an old movie, but I'm just going to reference Lord of the Rings. But like the way, like I've always like viewed it is just like, yeah, like I might be, come from like a different community or even like within our own communities, like there's like different viewpoints or just like different families or just like different ways they think about things. But like in the Lord of the Rings, like there's just like, you know, the, the race of dwarves, elves, men, everyone. But their one goal, like, they unified against was destroying the ring. And, like, the ring in this case would be, like, I don't know, like, U.S. imperialism or just, just the U.S. in general. Um, and just, like, asserting ourselves and wanting to, to live free, to be liberated um, because we're not. And, like, that's like the, that's the journey we're taking. I mean, we, not, we might not agree with each other. We might, like, fight, fight amongst each other. But as long as, like, we're moving forward to... Um, just like destroying the ring, but also like, you know, there's, there's work happening that even like we might not all be aware, aware about and even work that we might not agree with. Like my, 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 my non-strength, I don't know how do I would say that my least strength, like whatever um, is like, I don't know, like talking about legislation or being with legislators or like, um, like petitioning, like those, those aren't my strengths, but there's people out there doing that work. And it's also like, you gotta, you got like, there's different ways to, um, again, for lack of a better word, like skin this sheep. So, you know, like, um, we're all doing this work. We're all trying to defeat Saruman. We're all trying to destroy this ring. And you know what? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just proud to be a part of this fellowship. So you, you, you all should too. Um, and if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings, just, just watch it. Um, and yeah, well, okay. Actually, since I got the mic too, oh, God. Um, it's a Navajo taco, not Indian taco. Oh God, <laughs> he's trying to fight after this is what's happening. I'm like, do y'all want to address that and come back to me? I know. I was like, I thought we just said fellowship. <laughs> but we, I mean, <laughs> divisiveness on the I mic. Know, I mean, right? I mean, Gimli and Legolas were beefing the whole time. So, like... <laughs> and that's the youth. Yeah, that's the I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, maybe just one quick thing. Um, I do think that there um, is a lot of room. You know, the beautiful about th thing about Lambac is that it didn't start with Indian Collective. It's not going to end with us. Mm -hmm. It exists way, way before any of us were alive. Um, as Crystal said, you know, it's from the first meeting with colonialism, right? With colonists. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that it has so much grassroots power and the origin with artists in so-called Canada, right? And the origin of people who are dreaming about what is, what is possible, that means there's a lot of room. There's a lot of space to fight and to carry this out, right? To fight for something, to be proactive for something. And, and as Demetria said, there's a lot of tools, you know? So how are we gonna use them to get the land back? How are we gonna use them to get people back to the land? That's the end goal. So I would say, and just encourage for folks to talk to us. You know where to find us, come and talk to us. If you have issues, come and hash them out. We need to engage the contradictions. Yeah. We don't have time to be scared of them. Yeah. So let's talk it out. Come and find us. We don't bite usually. Um, <laughs> but really, I think that's um, that's a step ahead. And 
you know, the, the thing about now is we don't know what step is going to make the big difference. But that means that we have to continue to make a few of them and then see what change we have. We don't know this roadmap. We're building it, right? It's okay to experiment. We should experiment. It's okay to fail so long as we keep on building and we do it with the right intentions. So awesome. we're not fighting for perfect. We're fighting for the land and that's going to be hard and messy, but you know, come through y'all slide through. Thank you for having us. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And I, I just want to say with, with the, the, this youth here and I, I consider you youth also, <laughs> um, you know, drugs and alcohol are a, a messy thing, but, I, for one, with Uniting Resilience, you know, I say drug-free. You know, we have somebody on, on, I think, every single reservation. Our Ogla Lakota reservation, we have a lady. Her name is uh, Mama Jules, and mm. she really fights mm -hmm. meth. Mm -hmm. She not only fights mm -hmm. meth, she fights the black snake. Mm -hmm. She fights these pipelines, and she's up there in action in, in every um, confrontation with the uh, the government and I really appreciate that. And and I know I I know there's probably some on the Navajo, you know, some up in the mm -hmm. northern Cheyenne. And I know all of our tribes have people like like this because you know I, I remember when I was really young, I was probably in grade school or high school and, and I remember this elder getting up on a mic somewhere at a powwow and saying, you know, if we can all come together, you know, this the United States is afraid because if we all sobered up and quit using these their drugs, we are going to reclaim a lot. And so I recommend utilizing that as well, putting that somewhere in there. I mean, that's just a suggestion. But our Lakota, our indigenous ways our cultural ways is clear mind clear body clear heart clear soul and you go into a, a inipi and you sweat all of that impurities off and that's the the drugs and the alcohol you know for me it's hard to even take aspirin you know for a headache i'm i try all kinds of things and i try not to get a headache so i really would would you know, propose to you to include drug-free, alcohol-free, and, and promote that in, in your campaign, in, mm -hmm. in all of the issues that you're going through, not just the land back, but mm -hmm. I know Indian Collective is vast in, in mm -hmm. a variety of, of different movements. So I would really want to thank you. I appreciate everything that you guys are doing. And you know, I've heard some grumbling, and I know it's your stomachs. I've kind of heard that, so <laughs> I better get you guys going to go eat. And <laughs> Crystal, I thank you with all my heart, and I I, I let you know that you know, we send greetings to to Nick and mm -hmm. all of your staff, and and you know we support you, and however we can help you, just keep mm -hmm. us in contact. Let's um, let's build. Yep. Yeah, and let's keep this connection going. And thank you guys, and and good yeah. luck to all of you. Thank you. Well, Pila, mm -hmm. I'm give you guys a hug. We'll be back in two minutes. Ooh. We'll be back in two minutes.
Hello, good evening. We are back and thank you for uh, your patience. I am here today, this evening with Hannah Laguerre, who is a OST college professor. Um, he did a lot of the, the work with uh, Uniting Resilience Indigenous Water Alliance. So I'm gonna have him speak about what uh, what the process was and how things came out. Right. Sure, thanks, Felipe. Yeah, like uh, like Felipe mentioned, I'm Dr. Hannon Laguerre. Uh, I retired from Ogallala Lakota College two and a half years ago, and uh, and since then, I've been working as an independent consultant with the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, helping write expert opinions and uh you know for their different uranium interventions around and uh and then when asked provide uh commentary or advice on uh, on things like what we're talking about here today uh so so my part of the project was uh uh january of 2020 i got a call out of the blue uh from somebody i didn't really know but I'd been recommended by someone else, and that happens from time to time. So I, I met Chuck, and we we had a series of meetings at the at a coffee shop where I, in the town I live in. And out of that, he explained, you know, what was going on, and asked if I'd if I'd help out. And uh, and so sitting there at the coffee shop, we wrote a grant, a ten thousand dollar grant. And uh, and then you know within a within a week of finishing that. Uh, we were out in the field sampling in the snow and ice. And it was uh, me and Muffy and Chuck, and we drove around in the snow and ice and cold, chipping, uh, you know, the ice so we could get to the water. But then we, we, we drove around and for three days uh, sampled water up and down the Nebraska, or the, sorry, South Dakota, Western South Dakota. I live in Nebraska, so I, I kind of... I have that on my head. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, we went out and, and and despite the weather and the cold and sampling and the pitch dark by headlights in the middle of nowhere, we, we got the 16 samples. Uh, and uh, we had we had worked out a deal with South Dakota State University to do the analyses. Uh, you know, we got the we got the samples there in time. They they ran our analyses for us, and uh, and we found you know once the analyses were done, the, the idea mm -hmm. of the of the before I go any further, I'll talk about just the idea of it a little bit. So when I was approached at first, it was about how can we use uh, some analysis of some kind to figure out if the contamination we're seeing in a particular water body came from a man-made source like a uranium mine and there is some there is some literature about that and, and under some circumstances it can be done uh it's called elemental analysis we partnered with uh, a chemistry and engineering laboratory at sdsu and they they did our analyses for us um right so so uh you know once the analyses came back uh you know we went out looking, you know, expecting to find uranium in some amount because it's ubiquitous in our area, but we weren't quite prepared for how much we found. Uh, you know, and, and and when we sample and we sampled in January, and uh, that's when a lot of the rivers around have their lowest flow and contaminants are most concentrated. People still drink the water in the winter time, right? We all have to drink, regardless of whether it's summer and winter. And livestock still use it, and it's still used for different things. Uh, but 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 uh, we we were under a little bit of a, a little bit of time pressure. There had been, you know, some other events had gone on. Uh, the the uh, the Ogallala Sioux Tribes pipeline. It's shared by OST and Rosebud, but and and others other other reservations. But the the pipeline intake was one of the things we sampled and it and uh, it was over the maximum contaminant level for both uranium and mercury <clears throat> because we did a study in the winter time of course i mean the standard practice is to to do the same kind of thing in winter spring summer and fall so you get you know seasonal 
update because in the in the in the spring when the the flow is at its highest that's when the contaminants are most dilute and it's important to know you know about that but the uh, uranium was really high and uh, and also mercury is really high and you know and mercury is troubling um, it's uh, troubling uh, you know, with uh, with something like uranium there can be short-term effects but a lot of the effects are longer term uh, steady consumption of uranium and having it in your stomach and in your bloodstream uh, you know as it accumulates and sits around in there it could easily eventually produce a tumor and, and all a tumor is is a, a cell that's damaged during the act of reproducing which is normal because you know when when cells you know wear out and they're replaced they replace themselves so so as your cells wear out new cells are grow and, and replace the old ones and so they're constantly dividing so if you introduce something like uh, like a, a alpha particle emitter into the human body you know it's there's the potential for one of these particles and there's there's uh, lots of them if you have a if you have a lot of this stuff in you you know, there's, there, there's a lot of these alpha particles that shoot off, and they're like little bullets inside your body. And they can damage your dividing cells. And and if it hits it just right, the cell starts to grow out of control. And, and that's a tumor. Uh, and they, they become their own little organism within your body. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's cancer from uranium. Um, but mercury uh, affects the brain. Uh, it, it goes after your brain stem. Uh, it can lower your IQ and it can make you more aggressive. And then I just learned from a, a friend and colleague, a former student, that uh, that blood clots are an also also a common problem in premature birth and things like that. All right. So so mercury was a bit of a surprise. And and during the the treaty conference here, uh, we heard a little bit about uh, potential sources of mercury in the environment coal-fired power plants, coal mines, uh, as a legacy effect of gold mining. Uh, also, uh, you know, mercury co-occurs with uranium in some circumstances, and it's entirely possible that legacy uranium mining is a source. So so our goal was to, to use the chemical fingerprinting, but and it turns out we couldn't. I mean, there was just too much contamination to tease out uh, a, a man-made chemistry signal. And and so we realized that what we were looking at wasn't, uh, you know, trace amounts of contamination leached from the rocks or or even a small or faint chemical signal from a mine. Now, what we were getting was the overwhelming chemical and, and uh, con overwhelming toxic heavy metal contamination from uh, legacy mining. At least that's that's what that I, I still think that because uh, there's just so much. There's just so, much. and and a lot of the rivers we sampled pass almost exclusively over pure shit. So they're not gonna they're not gonna pick up uranium and mercury from that. They're gonna pick up arsenic, which is the common stuff in the pure shale. So so where is this mercury coming from? And uh, and nobody knows for sure. I mean, our study wasn't for that. I mean, ours ours was just a, a in way of grab samples. We we sampled sixteen rivers. Um, we sampled the Cheyenne River. The White River, uh, Porcupine Creek, Wounded Knee Creek, uh, and many more. The Moreau, Cherry Creek. So it, it basically every major waterway along the western side of South Dakota and all the major waterways uh, on the Pine Ridge Reservation, almost as far west as, as Rosebud. Um, so, so we couldn't pick out a, a uranium mine signal. Uh, the uh, another way we could have gone about it and, and when chuck and i were first writing the grant we decided not to do the second route and that's alpha spectrometry what that does is that gets at the isotopes of uranium which have a, a certain ratio in nature and then uh, mining uh uranium uh preferentially dissolves some isotopes over others and so the the natural ratio of elements uh is askew when, uh, when we're looking at man-made, um, you know, like in-situ leach mining uh, residue and things like that. So 
Uh, I mean that that could be done, but but the, that that's that uses even harder to acquire equipment and requires even even more uh, participation from from uh, outside groups. And not that that's a bad thing, but but the uh, the 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 Alpha Spectrometry Laboratory we had available to us was located in the Homestake Mine at four thousand eight hundred and fifty feet, side by side with the antimatter project and the dark matter project. But uh, but that's but working in the in the homesick mine has its challenges. Uh, you know, some someday we hope to have uh, an alpha access to an alpha spectrometer, maybe soon, uh, where we can do that kind of work. And and, and that's that's uh, I mean all of this is a is a shot in the dark. Uh, in in digging into this, the uh, the rules governing uranium mining in the United States are are such that, uh, you know, they they. The preliminary characterization of a of a site before mining begins, which is where we get these elemental ratios that we use, uh, you know, sometimes that work doesn't go on or or it isn't done well, and uh, and and that that was part of our challenge, although although it still should have been possible, you know, if uh, under some circumstances to be able to tease out you know some of the trace elements that we'd expect from an ISL mine. Uh, yeah, so so I learned at this conference that uh, several people, several groups are now taking an interest. The Rosebud is a keen interest in the mercury problem now. Uh, also, uh, there's treaty organizations that are taking this on, especially around legacy gold mining in the Black Hills. So that, that's how I came to be involved with the project. Uh, the first widespread dissemination of, of this uh, this work that we did was here at the treaty conference. Um, it's not peer reviewed uh, because of the short time turnaround. The, the the peer review acceptance and publication process, typically if it's an online publication, 18 months to two years, if it's a regular print publication, five years. And we didn't, th in our judgment, we didn't have time to wait. You know, th that wasn't what we were about to do. Uh, you know, the, the tribe's water problems are so severe that we needed, we needed some some parameters immediately, as soon as possible, and uh, and that's still true. Uh, now that we know how much mercury uh, there is around, uh, we really have to dig into that and get that solved. Well, th okay, thank you for that, Hannon. Okay, so what are, um, as far as after getting these testings done and um, seeing the numbers, as far as your the uranium and and so what what would a next step be for for the tribes to do to help clean the water or to help with um, uh, filter the water? Would that would would it are you, would it be okay to say that we would be having to put filters? on all the houses within the the tribes that there's a there's a couple of things yeah filters would be one of them <clears throat> there's a couple of ways uh the tribe can go uh i, I was talking to our uh, our colleague reno red cloud the uh, director of the ost natural resources regulation agency uh, in his in his view and hopefully he'll join us and he can talk more about this but in, in his view that legacy mining i was talking about that's the 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 waste piles the you know that there used to be open pit mines in western south dakota you know to get at uranium and and they're they're a vast area of fall river county to our west and uh, and the, the talus piles are 100 feet high and cover miles and miles and miles and miles it's a it's a large amount very large amount of, of talus uh, mine waste and, and it's never been remediated nothing's been done to curtail or control or mitigate the uh, the the leach from that the the leaching water uh, there's there's sulfur in the rocks the the water is acid and it, it leaches and the uranium gets loose in the environment from those talus piles and in Reno's opinion that's probably the source of, of uh, most of what we saw and I'm I'm inclined to agree and so the one of the first priorities would be to get after those their super fun sites but but there are things that can be done even planting grass over them. Right to keep the water from from going through it, 
uh, so quickly and, and dissolving so much of it. So, I mean, there's things that can be done. Ideally, it would uh, it would be all hauled away and put someplace. Uh, it could be buried in situ, you know, where it is, just fill in the old mines with it, and then maybe grass it over. But but th those are Band-Aid solutions. Um, you know, and, and and hopefully, you know, if, if that was the route that the tribe took, pushing for that, I mean, that, that would slow the introduction of the stuff, and, and maybe we'd see levels lower. Okay, so that's cutting it off at its source. Uh, or, you know, if the uranium mines are, are contaminating and are part of that, well, we'd like to get rid of those too, and there's a couple of legal interventions going on to do that. Uh, another thing people can do is, like, uh, like Philippa was saying, was get filters. And now, now the filters, there's a lot of ways to go. I mean, I know people who use Brita. Brita filters are perfectly effective. They're just really short-lived. They don't last very long. Uh, uranium is a strongly electrically charged atom, and it, it gobbles up all the places that can suck the uranium out of the water and uses it all up. And so you, you have to go through your Britas super fast. Um, also, there's under the sink uh, uh, filters. They're like the size of a large propane can for the grill and you screw it under your sink and then your sink water gets filtered. They're made of resin beads. Uh, you know, the resin beads in that filter draw off the uranium and the uranium coats the beads. And the, and the, the filters will also do other things besides uranium. So the filters will get most of the contaminants. But the more, of course, the more contaminants you have, the shorter live the filter. So, but so you, and then and then with those, uh, it, those reddened beads effectively become a nuclear waste. Uh, you can get uh, a bigger filters. Uh, you can get a community sized one. Uh, there's a, I was when I was at OLC, we participated in installing one in the Porcupine area, and I, I think that one's still running and, and might be filtering the water for a few families in that area. Uh, but it's bigger. It's about the size of a hot water heater. And then you can get even bigger ones, uh, you know, ones big enough to, to park in front of the intake of the mini Wachoni pipeline and possibly filter the water that comes through. Uh, you know, that's, that's, those are resin bead filters. There's also reverse osmosis. Uh, those use big uh, plastic sheets as osmotic membranes. The water passes through, but the, the plastic sheet catches the, the cations, the uranium and mercury atoms. <clears throat> but but that's the same, we have the same issue with that, is that anytime you filter uranium out, you've got a filter with uranium on it, right? And so then what do you do with that? That becomes nuclear waste, like medical waste, like an x-ray plate that has to be disposed. Uh, there's facilities around that bury that underground, but, but that has to be considered, you know, if that's gonna be a reservation-wide thing or a South Dakota statewide thing, then, then that has to be considered. Uh, but yeah, filtering filtering is probably the best way. Uh, what can people do before they get a filter? There's there's lots of things they can do. Uh, you know, and, and I advise people if if you're in a situation where you can't get get your water filtered, uh, the the best thing to do is to try to dilute the contaminants using bottled water. Or, or even less contaminated water. It does make a difference. Even, even uh, a half, oh, I, I've got the data here in front of me. Uh, thanks, Philippe. But yeah, I can, I can talk about that to get specific amounts, right? So the maximum contaminant level for uh, uranium is 30 parts per billion. That means that if you've got a, a, a billion uranium molecules or uranium atoms or compound molecules if it's in combination with something then uh, then then 30 of those out of that billion water molecules this happens to be uranium um, but but what I what I think is lost for a lot of people is you know how many how many how many water atoms are there in a cubic centimeter of water 10 to the 26th that's 10 with 26 zeros right so there's still billions of uranium atoms in that cubic centimeter of water. You know, it, it's not just 30, right? So, so we drink them by the billions. Uh, fortunately, our kidneys can filter them out, you know, we can pee them out. But, uh, but, but over time, accumulation is bound to occur. So, so what can people do? 
uh, if you're if you're accumulating uranium in your body and it's in your bloodstream, you basically just have to wait it out and hope. But but it accumulates a sediment in your stomach. I'll come back to that. Um, and it accumulates in your stomach, and then it hangs around there. And you can take pills and stuff to get it out. You can do different things to dilute your water. What you shouldn't do is boil your water. Okay, so the the uh, because that just concentrates the contaminants. So I'm, I'm looking at the data we got. Um, the the Cheyenne River it was at 55.4 parts per billion. We have three samples from the White River. Uh, the lowest is 63.9 parts per billion, double the maximum contaminant level. Uh, the highest is 108.2 parts per billion. That's three times the maximum contaminant level. Let's see, White Clay Creek, 38 parts per billion. The Little White River, 32 parts per billion. Uh, Wounded Knee Creek, 41 parts per billion. White Horse Creek, 50.1 parts per billion. Pump, uh, Porcupine Creek, uh, 46.7. No Flesh Creek, 32.5. Potato Creek, 27.7. That's one of the lower ones. Uh, the Belfouche River, 49.1. The Grand River, 24.7. The Moreau River, 45.5. Cherry Creek, 53.3. And the intake of the Minnie Wachone Pipeline on the Missouri River, 30.5. Um, the, the Mercury uh, MCL is 15. And, and, you know, like the uranium, these sites all had high levels of mercury as well. Uh, so, so, the, so filtering... But I spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, I spent six months last year, you know, trying to come up with some recommendations. And, you know, and, and I thought that there's filters and there's things, right? There's, there's these hard things that, that, have to, that would have to happen, right? Getting the cooperation of government agencies and, you know, counties and all this. Um, you know, there, there's challenges to doing something like cleaning up Edgemont's talus piles. And, and it's going to take years. Uh, maybe a decade. So what do people do in the interim? Well, I mean, it would really help if, uh, you know, if there was more transparency where, you know, people on the in and around the reservation were aware of every water test, you know, that, that goes on. If they were posted in public buildings like cab offices or whatever, then, uh, you know, then people could see them and they could, they could participate in keeping track of it. And then, you know, and if, and if they're uneasy about the contaminant levels in their community, they can go to their local, uh, their district councils, or they can, they can go to other elected leaders and they could, they could uh, call up the tribal agencies. I mean, there's things, there's things people can do, you know, and the, I, I'm not a tribal member. Uh, my family is from Quebec, Canada, largely, and also some old Mayflower English from New England. Uh, although, uh, you know, I, I, I've picked the, the French side to identify with, um, you know, and uh, and so, you know, this this is uh, I mean, I'm, I'm here to advise and support. Uh, but but I mean, I can I, and part of that advice would be, you know, initiate other what I call uh, uh, soft measures, things, behavioral things that people can do ranging. I think the first recommendation that I suggested in my report was that uh, you know that more emphasis being uh, placed on uh, telling some of the traditional stories, uh, you know, in Lakota that concern water, right? Because because uh, you know it's the, these concepts are are built into the language. Some of the concepts that you know how the how the people uh, view their relationship to the world and why water is sacred. Right? And so and it, so if you teach kids that worldview instead of what they see on TV, you know, then you can instill in them, uh, you know, an environmental consciousness. M much like the difference between uh, kids these days have a much higher environmental consciousness than I did when I was a kid. And that's because in the 1970s, people started talking about it, talking about, uh, you know, garbage and trash and pollution. You know, and when I was a kid, it was Godzilla versus the smog monster. Right, so the smog monster was like a personification of the world's toxic pollution. Right, so 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 start with with the kids and start with the language, and uh, and then start with transparency. So that I mean, if the population, if people are aware of what's happening to their water, right, then they're more inclined to elect people 
who also care about their water. Right. And, and that's how you, that's how you get action, you know, from your, your local government is, uh, you know, if, if you don't like the way your town is being run, run for city council, right. And then have a say it's the same way. I mean, if you're concerned about water you run for elected office and then carry you v- your views with you, you know, in, into that office, because that's, that's where real change needs to take place. I mean, someone like me can run around, you know, the prairie forever sampling badlands and testing water. But, but until, until that strikes a nerve with somebody, uh, that nothing really happens to improve it or change it. So, I mean, so, so pay attention to who's being elected and, and why and what for, you know, and what it is they support. Um, that's a big one because political will to, to, to combat things like climate change and, and water contamination, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, interests that, that, uh, will lose money, you know, if, if these, if these situations change, right. There's, you know, there's, uh, you know, why, you know, if a population is sick, you can sell them health care, right. That's, that's what it is. Uh, you know, and even, even though there's IHS and stuff, right. That's, that's still, it, it generates, uh, money and, and moves money around and, and people profit from that. Not the people who are sick and suffering from the contamination, uh, you know, but the ones that have the resources, you know, to get them through it. Uh, I mean, that's part of it. And, and uh, in, in, in our case here in, in this part of the country, you know, I, you know, we want to get these uranium mines out. They're serial polluters, you know, and, and in order to do that, we need that political will and we need the data because it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be a combination of data and political will that brings it all to an end. Okay, thank you, Hannah. And, you know, we really appreciate you being an ally with this. You know, we, we're doing this for our tribes, and you're in there helping and, and doing this research and getting these tests done, and we do appreciate you being one of our allies and helping us to get all this information and gather it and put it together. So I, I do, we do thank you for that. I just want to mention that, um, you know, when, when Hannah and my wife, um, Muffy and Chuck went out and did the testing, um, I, I stayed at home and when they returned, you know, and Hannah did his report, my wife showed it to me and I didn't understand any of the numbers that was on that report. I didn't know what they meant. I, 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 I was just like, I, I didn't know. <laughs> so when she explained it to me about what those numbers meant, um, it, it was hard. It was hard for me because nobody knew how high the uranium was in our creeks, in our river, in our water. And um, I, I have children and grandchildren that live on our reservation. And I got scared. And I wanted to tell people about, you know, this t- these tests and these numbers. Now, I, I didn't. I, I didn't say nothing. Um, I did tell my mom, my mother, my Ina, and I did tell my children. So my Ina drives all the way from the reservation to get get her water. She doesn't drink the water to Rapid City. So, I mean, I'm really glad that they did this testing and I'm just, I, I just would like if anybody can support them to go out and do more testing and support what, um, what our fight is and what we're, what we're trying to do to help the Ochete, Ochete So, you know, um, Hannon, with that, Okay, how how can a political leader get a buy-in? Yeah, that transparency I was talking about, right? So, so I mean, so what has to happen, right? In order in order for uh, political leadership to change and move in the direction of solving these problems, you know, they, you got to elect people. You got to elect the right people. 
uh, you know, and, and there's, there's good hearted people everywhere, you know, um, but there's, there's more to it than just having a good, I mean, a good heart is the perfect place to start, but there's, it's also a lot of hard work and, uh, and it, and involves, you know, lots of people. I was having a conversation, um, earlier and, and I was asked, you know, what's it going to take? And I personally, I think it's going to take a diverse group of people. You know, I'm a, I'm a scientist, but you know, and, but some people aren't convinced by science. There's a, there's other, they're convinced by something else. Right. You know, a lot of people, you know, like, like it is with COVID and stuff, they don't take anything seriously until it happens to them. So people who have had a, a relative die of cancer, you know, they're really aware of uranium. Uh, if somebody has blood clots or a premature birth from blood clots from the mercury, they're very aware of the problem. So they, they don't need convincing. But there's a lot of people like the people that haven't had COVID. You know, they think it's a, they don't think it's real. It doesn't, it doesn't affect them. Right. And so, but, but the, the ironic part is, is that once it gets bad enough, you know, to affect those people and convince them, you know, it's on the verge of being too late. You know, uh, so so conferences like like the one we're at now, uh, papers like the one I did, you know, I mean, there's there's problems with it. It's not peer reviewed, so colleagues haven't looked at it. I mean, I've shared it with colleagues, and they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, you should do some more," right? And and that's what it is. It's a, it's a it's a first step. Uh, I would call it a pilot study. It's it was simply uh, 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 a well, it was well done, but it was limited. Right. And, and but but the thing that we learn from limited pilot studies like that is, is there a problem worth pursuing, you know, or not? Because sometimes, you know, there might be a high uranium, high uranium or high mercury in just one little place, you know, like we thought west of Pine Ridge. But but until you actually go out and sample and test, you don't know what it is in, you know, in the adjacent watersheds or or in the case for, you know, the the White River where we sampled it, it was on the southern border of the reservation, almost Nebraska. But then, and you can't generalize to the northern part of South Dakota, you know, 200 miles away. You actually have to go there and sample it, right? And so there's, we, you know, I would like to see the, 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 the Belfouche River sampled from its headwaters to the confluence of the Missouri. I'd like to see the Missouri sampled the whole way. Right. So that so that we can we can better understand what this is, because people are going to it could come down to people uh, not drawing water from where they live or moving if there's too much of it around and they're too much at risk or if they have small children, if they have elders. Right. So that the, the exposure is there. And the problem with these toxic heavy metals is that they have no smell. They have no taste. Uh, radiation burns you, but it burns you in such a way that it, it's between your nerve endings and you never feel it until it gets super severe, right? So, so you can, you can, you can be damaged by this stuff and, and have no real symptoms until too late, right? Until that tumor appears or until that blood clot appears. And that's how it is with these contaminants. I mean, if it was stinky sewage, like an organic contaminant might be, uh, you know, then, then it, you'd have that, you would might have a chemical smell or you might, it might smell like uh, decay or something, but, but that's not how it is with the metals. Uh, if they're super concentrated, sometimes you can, uh, there's a coppery taste that goes with it, um, but not always. Uh, uranium is a metal, mercury is a metal, so they, they, they taste metallic, um, but not all the time under all circumstances, you know, and that, and that's, that's the thing is that, People don't realize they're being exposed, and and the data is out there, you know. But but it's not widely shared. It, it it's it's shared among the scientists. They have no trouble getting a hold of it. It's just emailing PDFs around. But but what about people who live out in the country? You know, in in a in a in a more remote county somewhere. You know, they 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 don't know. So I mean, part of it is uh, informing people, and if people know. Not, not they, and they, they know, and, and they, they get, I'm scared about this stuff too. I mean, I earlier in my career, and when I was doing mapping and just in finding all these uranium outcrops around, I didn't realize the danger I was in, you know. But but now I do because I'm better informed, and, and it's that way with everybody. Once everybody gets better informed, then they can make those informed decisions, which is why all government to government 
consultations and things like that and, and, and activities and uh, require in the informed consent of the people, right? You need the informed, you need the people need to inform because they, they need to know that they're elected leaders or the people that are appointed by those elected leaders, whether they're effective in helping them or not. Okay, uh, with that that being said, can you, um, uh, about the elected leaders, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Red Dawn Foster's legislation on the surface and groundwater? Sure. Uh, so, so we know about the redistricting that happens and the possibility that Red Dawn might lose her Senate seat you know, in the next election, or very likely will. I mean, that's that's why it was redistricted the way it was. Uh, so, so she views this as uh, as possibly her last best chance, you know, to make a, a significant impact in this area. And so, in in the, the last couple of days since the this conference has started, we've talked to some people. We've talked to some water managers. We've talked to the tribal chairman's water alliance. We've talked to a bunch of people to figure out what everybody's priorities are. And the priority, priorities are water, quant, uh, water quality. To this point, most of the focus, like in Nebraska and South Dakota, has been on quantity. Uh, quantity is fine, and, and everybody would like more water. But, but what they don't consider is that once water is contaminated and can't be drunk, used by animals, uh, put on plants, right, water can be easily contaminated to the point where it's not usable anymore, right? So that's the same as having no water. Uh, all it does is take up space and be radioactive, right? So, so the more water is contaminated, the less we actually have. Uh, and, and that, to me, that's, that's super important, you know, because uh, you, know, you, want, you want water that's clean enough to drink so that it doesn't harm you. But, uh, but that's, that's a tough one. Um, did I did I answer your question or did I get off track? I'm good. No, no you're good. You, what was you, the surface and ground? The, the surface and the groundwater. Um, as far as the 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 legislation with the uh, right. red dawn. Oh yeah. So so part of that legislation, uh, there's um part of it will be to create a record. Uh, you know, with all of something like with introducing some legislation, the the senator can uh, can get the definition of terms into the official state record. Uh, she can call witnesses to testify during hearings to ex to expose more of this problem and dig into it a little bit. And and one of one of the goals of the legislation will be to to get South Dakota to recognize that service and groundwater are part of the same system and should be managed as one thing. Right, so there's this concept in hydrogeology called the water cycle. Rain comes down, some soaks in, some runs off. Uh, you know, and, and if it's in the surface water, it, uh, it evaporates or transpiration from plants, it goes back up into the atmosphere and the cycle resumes. So, so when rainwater gets into uh, streams and rivers, uh, the, the streams can lose water to the aquifers they pass over if the aquifers don't have water in them. And streams can also gain water from overfull aquifers that they flow over. So when, when a stream loses water to an aquifer, it's called a losing stream. When it gains water from an aquifer, it's called a gaining stream, right? And so there's, there's complete exchange. Well, and that's not even counting things like secondary porosity. Secondary porosity is faults, fractures, and cracks in the rock that allow fluids to, to migrate. And, and we're close to the Black Hills. The entire region is fractured and faulted and busted up. The whole place is like a sieve. And, and water can travel underground through secondary porosity all over the place and places you wouldn't expect. Uh, what are some of the consequences of that, right? So, I mean, Shadron, Shadron, Nebraska got its water up prior to 2007 from a stream that, uh, that, that fed by springs along the Pine Ridge. And then we had a, a 3.1 earthquake and the water in that in that feeder stream disappeared. It, it all went down into a crack into the aquifers. All right. So, I mean, that's that's the that's the perfect example that I can think of. I mean, a, a stream disappeared. And so we had to relocate Shadron's water supply to a center abandoned center pivot 20 miles south of town. Uh, you know, that 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 happens. So so the the idea would be that that if we can get South Dakota to acknowledge that uh, 
groundwater and surface water mix and are part of a, a, the same system, at least within an individual basin, then that would help tremendously. Because then when contaminants are introduced to the surface water, we would automatically worry about the groundwater. When contaminants are found in the groundwater, we would automatically worry about the surface water. And so overall, we'd just be paying more attention to the water. And you can do things like you can introduce dye, you know, uh, chemical dyes, and they're, they biodegrade, so they're not harmful to the environment. But you can introduce these dyes into surface water, and it'll, it'll find its way into groundwater and then come up out of a well. You can also pump dyes down into the well and wash for it at springs, right? And so this is how you establish how the water moves around underground and on the surface through and around the landscape. And you have to do that. The, the, uh, the, uh, the agencies over on Rosebud, I learned, are, are very advanced at that. They have a really good understanding of their reservation and where their streams gain water and where they lose water. I would love to see that done on Pine Ridge. You know, there's a, there's a lot of badlands area that are all cracked and faulted and water disappears through those cracks. Also, there's cracks everywhere and water comes out. We have a lot of springs. So, so what, what's going on with that as the contamination increases and, and climate change goes on? I mean, this is, this is all important stuff to know. And the better informed uh, tribal governments are about, about the, their entire system, you know, they can manage it better. Right. So so the idea would be, you know, the uh, you know, to, to move this forward and by by improving the water circumstances across the entire state of South Dakota, which is what the South Dakota legislature would do, then, uh, you know, that would that would decrease demands uh, on because people off reservations want the water that's on reservations. Right. But if the people off the reservations, if their water was better wouldn't need to go over and, and want the reservation's water, right? So, so you know, improving the water circumstances of everybody in South Dakota would benefit the tribes. It would create less demand on their water and more water would be available for their purposes. It would also possibly change the, the you know, the culture surrounding it. You know, there's nothing like realizing that, uh, and it might be just uh, information, you know, if, if Red Dawn can, can, uh, get a lot of publicity and draw a lot of attention to this issue, you know, it might have an impact on, on, uh, on the off reservation ranchers. You know, they might, they might start to worry and be concerned about their water because the rivers we sampled, you know, uh, you know, everybody uses them, right? The Missouri river is a, a big deal and all these other, and some of the people we talked to on our sampling trip, we talked to one gal uh, who had a ranch and uh, you know, and, we sampled the, the water in her place and she started, she was telling us about, you know, the, the, the issues she was having with her cattle and she was non-native and very interested in what we were doing. She even took the time to take us out through the deep snow in her tractor <laughs> and got us close to the water so we could sample it. So people do care. They just don't know. They, they don't, uh, they don't follow science blogs on the internet they don't uh, they don't read numbers or they don't go to get scientific papers they just they just don't have any idea that this is going on you know so so better informing people would be is i think a huge thing so uh yeah that's that's got to be important and if red dawn can accomplish that that would be great that would be senator foster's it'd be a good legacy it'd be a great way to spend you know, uh, your time in the legislature is doing something meaningful. And, and that's what she wants to do. That's what she charged us with when she said, you know, when she asked us to sit down and, and write something up for her. And, and, and by, by, by doing all this under water quality, there's a lot of things we can do. We can get the ceremonial use of water recognized, right? Okay time oh i'm out of time <laughs> out of, yeah i i apologize for that but i do thank you for being on here with us anna and we will be back in two minutes all righty okay thank you
Hello, we are back from the EBT trail uh, at Walmart with our push carts. So we are here at the Holiday Inn uh, in Rapid City, second floor, Uniting Resilience Indigenous Water Alliance. We'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and everybody that has been on and has been a part of this uh, very powerful, powerful movement. I really appreciate all of you, and I encourage you to uh, go ahead and hit us up on our websites. You know, everybody that we had speaking to today and right now have websites, and you can reach out and see what our movement is and see how we're growing, and, and we are really coming into a super area of, of unification of very, very powerful matriarchal and, and very, very powerful allies supporting this movement and, and recognizing that we all need to work together. And with that, I want to introduce, uh, let her introduce herself, but we have a really good, good super, super nova of our indigenous turtle island and I am so happy to call her my friend, and she is here, and I call her my indigenous sister. This is Robin. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, happy wash day. I, I We went into the evening now, so I'm Robin Lebeau Imachiape, Tatanka Agliwi Imachiape. I'm from Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. I have a nonprofit called the Tumbleweed Society. Other than that, I'm just a human being um, doing my part in this earth, you know, wherever I can to empower people and empower um, whatever movement I feel in my nagi, my soul, that I can really get behind and, and stand behind and put my um, energies into. Mm -hmm. And so water has always been that movement in um, human rights and civil rights. And so... That's just a little bit about me, Robin. Right on. Okay, so one of the biggest things that is is going on is, and how I know you is that you were a you were an officer, law enforcement mm -hmm. officer as well. And you know, we met. I think it was a couple years ago when we was on our quest with the Cheyenne River. We started conversation, and and you know, I asked a couple people there, and they were telling me about you, and and then we kind of visited some and. You know, you're very, very resilient. You've come through so much and, and I really appreciate, you know, you're not even you're not even old yet and yet you've been through a lot and you've experienced a lot. And I know this IRA government, you was a part of that. Mm -hmm. And and so you you've seen it from a level of working within this uh, governmental positions and then working within the voting process and the, the getting in elected and 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 then you know you you experienced a um health issue and now you're viewing it from a you know your tumbleweed society is really about the environment and all these issues of our government one of the biggest things i was sitting there thinking about this and, and I wanted to bring this up with you was what I realized as a law enforcement officer and as an indigenous um, strong female, you know, that the constitution of the United States, which we had to make a pledge to an oath, we had to take that with that um, Bible. The United States constitution is only set forth for one thing. What, and, and I know that, and we need to get this out there because nobody wants to talk about this. And it's, the Constitution is only there to protect a white, or shall I say, a Caucasian male. That's all that Constitution was designed by Caucasian males to protect Caucasian males and they left those gray areas so they can float and get themselves out of certain issues as well. But they utilize it to really take down 
the indigenous minority people on this on Turtle Island. How do you feel about how that is designed and how us as women were just held down through that? How do you feel about that? And what do you want to get out to everybody on that issue? Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> That was that was a lot. We went from IRA to the Constitution to you know let's uh, break down some huge barriers, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so, um, one thing is we always say in God we trust. Ugh. You know, mm -hmm. I swear to defend all foreign and domestic. Yep. You know, and so you really have to uh, you really have to look at the oath it, it, that we take in not only the Constitution, but we take it in the um, in everything. IRA, it's it's the same oath all the way across when you become a police officer, um, any sworn office that you take. So. Who is who is your commitment really to? And how I always looked at it is how my ancestors always taught me. And they said, you can, they can make you do whatever they want. Like they did, they made us do in the boarding schools. They, they made us, you know, and we had to do that or we were going to get beat. And some of us were almost, you know, beat to death if we didn't um, swear to that Bible or, you know, mm -hmm. and we had to do some of these things to survive. And so my job is to help the people. And so do I 100% solely believe that oath? It, does it mean that I don't have any integrity? Does it mean that I don't have any ethics? No, because my grandparents raised me. They, they raised me with some morals and ethics. Lakota values. So my commitment is under the Milky Way, under the stars, a creation and like I said, when we spoke on, we spoke on Monday, if you can't understand that my race is Lakota, that we have four bands, and you can't accept me for who I am, first and foremost, before I'm even um, supporting like Two-Spirit or Muslim or anything, Christianity, I'm Lakota, you're Lakota, everybody is Lakota if we're talking to someone from the um, Oshete Shakoin or the mm -hmm. Titawan people. Yep. Um, we can't take that away. I can't take it away that I'm I'm this this um you know how long it took me to say that I'm a a woman of color? <laughs> you know, I'm like they said you're a woman of color. Oh I'm always been brown. I just really didn't understand that. Then on top of that I'm now doing like you brought up the um police officer role. That was huge because, of course, us women can't do that role. Mm -hmm. Let a, let alone go to a paramilitary uh, training uh, training where some men don't pass, mm -hmm. you know. But yet we passed, and so that was held against us too because we were passing at a place that, you know. And then now we're in resilience fights where we're not. They don't want us to be at either, you know. They told me in the IRA. You can't be here because leader, leadership roles like this you can't have. So everywhere I'm going because this constitution, like you said, is for wig wearers, I call them, uh, gray wig wearers, because that's the uh, parliament. you mm -hmm. got to take it back to the Papa Bowl, back to the uh, queen and, you know, who's running Canada. And they're constantly telling us, no, 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 no. And... So I just said, no, somebody told me somewhere I could be anything I can be and don't ever let anyone tell you no. And us, we have a way of life. So if you can't accept me first and foremost, whoever is out there listening that I am a Lakota, I'm a Lakota, I have a role. And I have a way of life. And my creation story is I come from Wind Cave and I'm of the Buffalo um, people, Pete Oyate. I said mm -hmm. my Lakot name. It's woman who brings back the buffalo. That's huge. You know, my family named that when I was 16, Tatanka Gliwi. 
I have to live up to a woman who brings back the buffalo. Look at all these people wanting to bring back the buffalo now. When my son was nine, me and my son, when I first got on the IRA, we had to stand for the buffalo in the middle of winter. 22,000 acres of our tribe was going to be seized by the IRA. And the U.S. Marshals were coming at us. I don't tell that story very much, too. But the land was going to be taken and we were going to go into receivership. So a lot of people look at you on that oath, but it's not that I have no ethics or integrity for that oath that you take. I always remember that I have a, a obligation to the creator. And as long as I'm keeping my life right, right with him in line, I don't care what they say, you know? So that's how I feel about that um, oath. <laughs> that constitution. Yeah, that constitution, yeah. you yeah. know, because look at the 14th Amendment says Indians not taxed. And the First Amendment says Indian not taxed. Mm -hmm. But why did they make that? You guys are talking about uh, redistricting in the state of South Dakota. It was for Indians to be counted. Yep. You know, Indians to be, all we are is a number to people. That's it. Just keep counting us and counting us and taking and taking and taking from us. Let's let's count them so they we can use them to vote because what if not we're gonna violate their 1968 Indian Civil Rights Act, you know. But, Put them in prisons. Yep. Get the money for it, take their children, get their money for the foster care. Yep. But we're not gonna let them have any real rights. But we're gonna make them go fight their war and use their language to win those wars. See? Mm -hmm. It's constantly using us, but never giving us anything back that was already ours to take our ours um that, to have to have yeah we were already here and they just keep taking 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 we have to remind them that yeah i i really really love that and i i almost thought in my mind that you would say exactly what what you said on the the wig wearers because that's what i call them too <laughs> and you know, the Mount Rushmore, those are the wig wearers. Mm. Those are the wig wearers. And as long as uh, Mount Rushmore is in the Black Hills, there's going to be racism. And and that's hard because, you know, my wife and I, we have five children and, and numerous, you know, grandchildren on the way. And, and yet unborn taco just coming. And... How do we deal with that knowing that they are going to be subjected to this racism? I mean, right now, here in Rapid City, and the reasoning for all of the things happening in, in indigenous countries is that the Lakota Nation Invitational is being held, and there's like 25, over 25 teams here, and all of the motels are packed with uh, indigenous people how are we gonna be okay with with the constant knowledge that you know these kids are growing up and they're playing in a, a place that was renamed they've just built a new thing and it's called the monument in recognition of mount rushmore and they call this the president state and, you know, I, I know from our great grandfathers, and I'm sure you have some really powerful stories about these things, is that I always want to come to this, that how can we allow these four white wig wearers in our Hesapa, our sacred Hesapa? And, you know, you you did some good, good um work with the Peshla and you was not recognized for that. I recognize you right now. That's good work. Mm -hmm. I honor and respect you in, in going with the, your moccasins on the ground, knocking on those doors, getting that support and getting that mazaska to, for the, the, all the indigenous tribes to, to receive that and have, we have that 
there in the hills now and that kind of feels good that really feels good for all of our ocheti shakoni but how do we start a i mean my wife and i were going home last night and we experienced racism it's 2020 you know i'm 53 years old man and what do you tell your son what are we going to tell our grandkids how would you address that right now with all of these people watching? What I address it is how I address um, our tumbleweed societies. We have to keep empowering our own selves first and our own people. Once you build yourself up to love yourself first and you kind of, um, when you build that love up so much, you start dismantling a mindset and you encourage that unbreeding of racism because each each races person is breeding a mindset mm -hmm. and so each generation is breeding a mindset of racism and year after year we're just going to keep on breeding this yep. and how are we supposed to encourage, you know, the Beatles sang songs, you know, Alton John, all these people sang beautiful songs. Trudell talked about it. People talked about all ending these races, racism. And, um, but yet, but yet we're still breeding it. Mm -hmm. And when I say breeding it, it's, when you have a new child born, if you don't teach them the colors, you don't teach them the, um, they're not supposed to love certain genders. You're supposed to love one another as a human being. All this stuff, you can wear whatever you wanna wear. Then you're stopping that cycle. You're yep. breaking those cycles. So some of the biggest people that are still infiltrated in the state of South Dakota haven't broke those barriers. And so we just have to keep breaking those barriers. We just have to keep getting stronger. We just have to keep pushing forward beyond them and working around them and growing stronger and, and infiltrating their systems we did a little bit of infiltrating on them at a water meeting. Yep. Yes, we did. Come and they want, they they looked at us in fear, like we were going to be coming, we were going to be violent. Mm -hmm. And here we were funny and we were, we said what we had to say and boom, we left. Mm -hmm. And they're expecting now, you know, some people want to go a different way. That's fine. There's a time and place for that. Every movement you take, there's a time and place. Mm -hmm. So that's how I deal with that. But um, we are a people now that have um, mixed culture now. Mm -hmm. And we have to be, we have to prepare that and we have to prepare the old ones and we have to stop that breeding. And each generation is going to be growing stronger because that one love and that unity is coming stronger. And as long as we're doing it, we're growing stronger than those who are still breeding it. Right. And that's dismantling that mindset. If you're dismantling that mindset, then that word co colonizing and uh, decolonizing, that's obsolete because that's their words. Right. We're dismantling a mindset. It's all up here. And once you do that, you, you're coming back to your creator and our creation stories and stuff like that. So would you go out on a limb and, and go and draft up something and start a process of getting rid of that Mount Rushmore? Oh, heck yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm, with, um, I'm with dismantling that, um, that mindset over there um, in those minds that we, their heads, you know, um, and people say it's part of our history and all of that, but we don't see any um, statues other than Crazy Horse being built throughout South Dakota. And actually, 
Um, I took my nieces and nephews to Pierre, South Dakota, where you can see a whole museum of the KKK stuff inside of there. And I wanted them to see that because they have a whole museum on KKK. And there's little subliminal um, messages and things in these buildings if you go around to the courthouses and stuff mm -hmm. of who some of the founders are and stuff. And that might be a whole nother podcast mm -hmm. here, but South Dakota has a strong history on those those images there. And that's what our kids aren't being taught in the right. school system. And that's what our kids aren't seeing. But you take them down to that little museum there or whatever it's called in South Dakota. And there's a whole cape and all of that yep. and everything. Hood. Hood. Yep. Yeah, all of that. So these are conversations that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And there's statues and stuff, but where where is our um where is our Lakota leaders and stuff? So well I I I for one, you know, I, I've been waiting. I've been waiting and I've been waiting and I'm sure you have been just in the same aspect that that I am in and we're have and, a joined party here, right? Yep. yep. Okay. And the, the thing about it is, is that, you know, I've, I've seen our elder women and, and our elder men, and they've taken up somewhat of a fight on, on that issue. But I'm going to go ahead and, okay, I'm going to say that I would like to see this in my lifetime that Mount Rushmore be dismantled and taken down. Yeah. I'd love to get the the younger generations um, inspired by, you know, there are some of us that were raised with knowing that those four heads up there that are called Mount Rushmore, this is called the Mount Rushmore State. And Has, Theodore Roosevelt. If I could interrupt you put real that, fast. Go ahead. When you here's one thing we can start with if we're gonna make some South Dakota legislation thing. Okay, so and and I say sometimes we have to chip away at these little things like this. So okay, we're gonna chip away at this big old rock. Okay. Yep. Yep. So let's start with um chipping away. I've I've been working with um uh my good Chapanji, Ali and me. We had a good conversation about this. What do you see when you drive into uh South Dakota? Welcome to South Dakota. Great faces, great places. Yep. It looks like a big old EBT card, your EBT statement. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. how come there isn't nothing that says anything about the Oshete Shakoi or the Titawan people? Yep, indigenous. So I want legislation. When we meet with those seven people, let's let's draft something that shows a whole different side entering South Dakota, you know? Let's let's change that right off. Why why we have to mm -hmm. look at a big old EBT card every time we come <laughs> into our homelands with with those great faces. That's a, that's okay? absolutely you wanna, correct. You I wanna, do. Can, I, I am. can uniting resilience start with that? You know, yes. let's chip away at at this rock. Let's chip away at the take those those signs down. Start at with the, the state. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. Thank you for that. We still haven't completed, but we are very, very honored and 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 um, I'm very blessed to have. That was young. Go ahead and I just I I'm not I can't even believe that we I, we are in the same location and and I really thank you for coming here and and go ahead. I'm gonna give you the the mic to. Thank you. Chante was saying that Mini Tahio we much happy. Na Mini Yuha Naju we much happy. A woman who stands by the water and woman who loves the water. Those are my given names for my family and my my people. So I'm um I'm not accustomed custom to being handed the microphone. I've always seized it uh, <laughs> much of my life and uh I've never been short and sweet in my life, so I'll, I'll try very hard um, to accommodate the, the time here. Um, I just came from downstairs and they're talking about co-management and uh, kind of raised my hand and asked to speak, but um, the bureaucrats are busy, the Forest Service and the USDA. 
Um, but I spent my life um, in a life struggle for our people. And I primarily worked for Oglala Nation for 40 years. In 1973, after Wounded Knee, uh, the traditional chiefs came to Standing Rock and asked for a uh, treaty conference. And Standing Rock being a pretty stable government at that time was um, accommodating. Uh, it was not without the, the bumps in the road because um, the attorneys and the bureaucracy tried desperately uh, not to have it and not to answer. But when Chief Wilscrow came in full regalia with the entourage from Oglala Nation, um, and he spoke only in Lakota, and he addressed the Staniwak Tribal Council. Uh, he came out of there with the unanimous decision to host um, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe would host the, the first International Indian Treaty Council. And so that was held on June 20th, 1974. And um, 5,000 people came from uh, many, many Indigenous groups. And uh, I want to explain the word Indigenous because I heard it twice today in the commentary amongst our people. Um, when we followed the mandate of the traditional chiefs who drafted that first declaration at Standing Rock in 1974, two objectives, very simple. And that's the way our people are, like the Sundance objective, very simple, to live. And uh, so that declaration had two objectives and the first one was to go to the United Nations and seek their um, assistance for what was happening um, at Wounded Knee and Oglala Nation. Um, the men being murdered on the outskirts, um, the, the goons that were a part of the, the running over of the people there, um, the desperate need and hour of Oglala Nation. So, um, in three years, we we sought the credentials to participate in the United Nations structure, and uh, we did that in 1977. Uh, we acquired the credentials to participate, and uh, we were advised that that was historic because it took an African nation 17 years before they could acquire their credentials. So we coordinated and hosted the first international conference on Indian people and their lands um, in Geneva, Switzerland in September 23rd, uh, 1977, 1977, yes. So we participated in dialogue, education, communication, and government to government um, with a priority nation to nation. And so um, we raised the status of Lakota Nation, um, Oglala Nation particularly. So um, for 37 years, we drafted, we initiated the drafting of the United Nations um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So. When we initially went there, um, my world, of course, was uh, Lakota. And uh, all the people looked and looked at each other and looked at us. And we couldn't not, we could not be a dominating force uh, where we're looking for mutual uh, participation and cooperation and um, benefit. So. I conceded at every level of diplomacy that I could. So um, then I said, okay, we're Indian. And we still got that look. Um, but in the process, we learned that there are natural peoples from every country in the world. Um, in Japan, the Maasai in Africa, um, in the Scandinavian countries, the Sami. Um, and so faced with that, 
we did not have a problem because as Lakotas, we have a world view with universal standards and um, pluralistic society. So it's um, a lesson that I learned that my world was bigger than being Lakota, uh, bigger than the hemisphere being Indian um, as we were have the misnomer. And um, the only word that uh, could apply to all the natural peoples, I still didn't like it was um, indigenous. But um, there was a consensus from all of the natural peoples there that that's possibly a word we could use. I didn't like it because it started out with indigent and that was not our status because we were very, very rich people in our own standards. But over time, I learned that the customary box um, is an empty box for our people in the United States. Um, so we desperately need to fill that box with our customary laws. And we have to insist um, that our laws and traditional knowledge prevail and interpreted from our language, um, very necessary. So um, that was my work for 20 years, um, including the UN United Nations Treaty Study, primarily based on the 33 treaties that the United States has with Sioux Nation, with the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota. And um, so it took 37 years for that document to be uh, accepted by the world. And um, in 1996, um, the countries of Australia, Canada, the United States, and England were the four countries that did not accept the declaration. So the, the chiefs helped me to draft um, a position paper, which I presented to the, the UN uh, committee on in 1996 that stated that we would initiate the process to um, light our council fires. By lighting those council fires, we were inviting the spirits of our ancestors to come and help us. So that's what happened at Standing Rock. And I know that um, the ceremonies were actually done, the spiritual ceremony that needed to be done uh, was also done. So um, all of our ancestors are here, the portals are open and um, evermore in our desperate hour, they came. So we called on Sitting Bull, the Crazy Horse, Russell Means, Vine Deloria, and every ancestor who stood in the front line um, on Mother Earth and so uh, we we advised uh, the, the four countries in 1996 that we would do that, and we did it. So um, time and space is, is monitored and measured in our own Lakota mindset, and however long it takes to, to acquire um, and reach those um, thresholds, um, we'll get there in due time. So um, that's what I was, um, I wanted to relate to that indigenous terminology because yes, that was the first objective to go to the United Nations and to sit in diplomacy with uh, the entire nations of the world. And a treaty study was done it took 10 years and the facilitator was a professor Martinez um, from Cuba. And he wasn't, he was not allowed to come into the United States. So we created a, a site at Oglala Lakota College and um, we testified by satellite. And so um, technology always um, intrigued me because I I, um, I didn't really understand Wakiya Oyate until now, 
until um, digital democracy entered Ochetisha Kongi camp and um, helped to defend those who face criminal charges just for exercising the digital democracy. So we we testified at that hearing. Um, I did at Kyle, and um, so there there is a document that came out, and that treaty study um, supports the Lakota Nation as um, an international concept, acknowledging the treaties under international principles and laws of Vienna Convention sixty two. So. It's um, it's recognized um, by the world community. So, I think that we accomplished uh, great missions for Oglala Nation in um, in Geneva, and the second objective is to create an embassy, an office in the Black Hills. I that's my interpretation because it um, it's a nation to nation relationship and the documents that we have that are part of the treaty, they are all nation to nation and upheld by different attorneys general who served in the United States um, Congress. So um, that's what we're talking about today. And so I brought the documents. I have the Sioux Nation um, mapping and the mapping is by uh, the seven council fires. It's a mapping of the Titoa, um, who are the seven bands in this area. And the Oglalas have the prerogative to um, create their own um, land base, so, so to speak. So um, I also serve as a proxy for some um, landowners in the private sector who um, have donated their land back to Ochete Shakoni. And we still have to decide um, a process that we're going to uh, utilize to transfer that land. Uh, there's a lady who donated 36 acres back uh, in Wyoming. And according to the mapping, that would belong to Oglala Nation. So. Um, there are three landowners who I am meeting with this week uh, here in the Black Hills who want to donate their land back. So it's continuing. There's a lady in Utah who wants to um, a dollar um, donate it for a dollar or wow. sell it for a dollar. Yeah. And there's one in North Dakota who is um, giving a life estate for that land. So the private sector is um, a part of that. And so at Ochati Shakui, we had uh, the family of Harney who came publicly acknowledging the Black Elk family and turning that name of Harney Peak over to Black Elk. And we had Custer's granddaughter who came as well. And Borglum's grandchildren, um, are in support of returning um, Mount Rushmore to the Lakota Nation. So um, it's not only ideas that people are presenting, it's our time and place that people are acknowledging and want to now do right for our people here. That's awesome. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, we, we were very, very blessed on Monday. We called this meeting real quickly and we were trying to, you know, reach out to you as well. I know you're very busy. Wow. I mean, it, it takes about 40 people. We got to go through 40 people just to get to you. <laughs> you're awesome. You're awesome. I acknowledge you as one of the great icons of our people, a very, very powerful woman for all of our people, not just uh, one um, tribe, but all of our tribes and, and, and every person that is uh, indigenously brown skinned and, and is born from a woman, you, you make us all proud and we thank you with all of our heart. We chose on you. Okay. Lama Yapi. 
for for my tios baye and for my grandchildren coming and grandchildren not yet born we really appreciate all that you're doing for us and and it's 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 hard and i know you've come through a lot um you know we were talking just before you got in and, and how you know my grandpa um he hantanka the big owl um big owl um ernest big owl was my grandpa he passed away when i was 10 years old and i stopped speaking lakota that day that he passed away he had a massive heart attack and yeah, I was just angry that I lost somebody that was really strong because, you know, he he's really um, the reason why, you know, I, I am coming to this this identity of um, realization for our next generations. You know, he's seen that in me as as his Takoja. You know, he passed a lot of, lot of good things that I still carry today. I still speak Lakota every now and then, you know, when I get around a lot of uh, natives and, and, and it, it feels good. It really feels good. And it, it, it's powerful in the sense that he said, Takoja, always remember that the Black Hills are not for sale. And I grew up with that. You know, I was uh, one of the ones that was uh, expelled from a Catholic school, uh, the Our Lady of Lords. I, I, um, I used to wear headbands. I used to wear my moccasins, and I had long braids. So my grandma would always put the mink, and, and I killed those mink, you know, our rabbit skins. And my own people, my own indigenous uh cousins and and friends you know they called themselves friends to me and they were brown skinned but they would make fun of me because I dressed like that and I was proud because that's how I grew up with my grandma and grandpa you know they really really made it awesome to be who I was and yet you know one day I was getting bullied so bad you know they pulled my headband and, and they grabbed that mink and they just put and it almost came off and I lost it I, I I fought back and I think during that time that fourth grade ancestral blood of um you know that uh, I'm not gonna take it anymore occurred and that change in me happened where you know I I just uh I fought back to them and beat them all up and I was the one expelled even though all of the sisters who were teachers and the father of the whole Catholic system, he was the superintendent, they kicked me out because I was a heathen. I was a savage. We can't have that here at this school. You know, they told that to my mom and my grandpa. They said, you can't, we can't have these uh, savages coming in and disrupting the other good natives. You know, we can't have them disrupting this this behavior. We got to teach them discipline. You know, I, I, I was so happy. I mean, I ran out of there and never went back. <laughs> so, and, and speaking on that level, you know, um, it was so good to know that, you know, my, my mom and dad, they would say, oh, we're going to go see, we're going to drop you guys off at grandma and grandpa's today. And they got chores and whatnot. So, Hey, I got to see grandma, you know, my grandma from a very young age. And I think she sat us all down, but she used to, we used to come and all the grandkids would get dropped off there. Just hug us up, kiss us up, love us up. Hey, grandma, how come you're always doing that? You know, and here one day she sat us down and I think I was about five or six. I was like a first, just out of kindergarten or first grade. I was really happy. And she sat us down and I said, Grandma, why do you do that? Why are you always hugging us up and, you know, what? why, why are you kissing us up like that? And she said, because my mom didn't. And she said, I want to break that and I want you guys to know love. She said, because uh, my mom was in boarding school and she got ripped away from her parents. And she said, I didn't get any love from my mom. And she said, I was in Carlisle, and my grandma, Evelyn Badger, 
she was, uh, she stayed there for, I think, like 12 years at Carlisle Indian Boarding School. And she broke that. You know, she broke that cycle of assimilation that they had. And they, my grandpa and grandma really taught, it, taught us um, not the assimilation way. I grew up with knowing all of the roots, all of the medicines. You know, I could go out right now and get everything that's needed to heal me if I get sick. You know, that's how, and I don't like to depend on the white man doctor. And so it's hard. It's really hard to navigate that that culture. And, and I've always wanted to to talk to you, and I was hoping Madonna would be here, but I'd like to ask you about the boarding schools and how you feel it really damaged our people or did it make us better? How? And you're, you're, you're talking live with a lot of people. You're going to reach a lot of people right now. So I'm the third generation boarding school in my family. My mother was in boarding school and Standing Rock actually had a boarding school in Kennel, community of Kennel. And um, my grandmother was an interpreter. She spoke fluent, um, beautiful Lakota, very reserved. Um, and she spoke uh, eloquent English. So she was an interpreter at the meetings, as was my mother. Um, my mother was a renegade. And I say that because she fought with a Catholic nun and she pulled off uh, that nun's veil and had a physical fight with her. So she was expelled from the boarding school. And of course that was not a good thing in those days because they frowned upon that behavior, but she um, she was a, a good lady, a good mother. Um, and so I, I'm grateful because my grandmother and my mother both loved um, their children and loved us and raised us uh, in the river bottom and were subject to um, a lot of persecution and so my grandfather being a cold talker um, had no fear and, uh, and that innate pride he had in his language and what he did as a patriot to the military mm -hmm. of the United States. Um, he was real rather loud and boisterous and um, would just just say things that, you know, uh, you know, just bellow it out and or he would say uh, when people were leaving so we all learned how to say nice things to people mm -hmm. um and but my grandmother would say Shh. she never um she whispered the language so um we had the language in our homes and i can understand i could speak in phrases and broken lakota <clears throat> but I can't orate and I always dream of that I could be standing up there and talking to my people and orating, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But my daughters are learning the <clears throat> all of the grammar and verbiage and all the um, new things. So I don't understand the written um, language only if I hear it, only the, the you know, the oral. So, um, I'm, I'm thankful for that, to, for holding on to that. But um, my mother and my oldest sister were, were um, interpreters as well. And my mother and my brother, my brother worked for law enforcement at Standing Rock for almost 30 years. And he was a um, dispatcher, as was my mother, um, which my grandfather was a dispatcher in the First World War and um, a code talker. So his pride, we didn't know that. And I, we were like, how come our grandpa's not afraid to talk loud? He's going around hollering, talking Indian. And that's what we said in our day. But um, I don't know my, my 
Standing Rock are very, very, um, the neighborhood is military. Um, most are, are, we have, Standing Rock has four, had 47 code talkers in the First World War and 17 code talkers in the Second World War. So Standing Rock has had more code talkers than any other group in America. Wow. But we're never accorded the, the, the pomp and circumstance uh, or given the dignity of that because recognition it re it uh, remained uh, a secret until 2010, and President Obama presented the medals in 2012. So my grandfather was one one recipient, but I have like five grandfathers who were part of that, and so that language never stopped in our home, whispered by my grandmother and bellowed by my grandfather. So um, my daughter, TPZ, would be jumping up and down and trying to say the words, copy her, her grandpa. So, um, so now she's part of that immersion um, program and um, guided by all of that experience. But the boarding school made, made you very submissive uh, obedient, um, very methodical. Um, and so my sister had like two master's degree and three bachelor's degree, but she was bilingual. So she taught at the local school and, um, and that was my grandfather's dictate. My grandfather went to Carlisle and his brother as well. Um, and today I'm still looking for his brother, Barney Pretensico, um, who is still missing from our lab. So uh, I thank Heather Thompson today for uh, finding my grandmother at um, Mountain View Cemetery uh, from 1918. So we came down here and gave her a send off to the stars. We sang her song would put little chairs there for the children and hampas and dresses and shawls and wasna and tobacco. Um, so we gave her that send off that she never had and her song and her name. So that was a good closure, but the I'm still looking for my grandfather. I'm in touch with the communication with the general who has posted the names, but my grandfather ran away um, I think the family, third family he went with had typhoid and they were dying in that house. So he, he ran away, but I think he also had typhoid. So he's buried somewhere. So we're yeah. looking for him in a Mennonite cemetery in Pennsylvania. So um, wow. I'll spend the life, the rest of my life um, trying to find him. And um, Carlisle has 750 graves of Ochechishakomi at um, their cemetery. Oh. They are a military college. Um, and so Danny Rock has um, adopted a resolution uh, to have an amendment to NAGPRA, the Native American Graves and um, Repatriation Act. So um, that amendment would include boarding schools and the land that it's situated on, be they fee, uh, regardless of the status, um, NAGPRA would apply. So hopefully we can get that adopted here and get it out to the National Congress and seek some act of Congress to address that uh, boarding school uh, application in, to NAGPRA. So um, I will be, um, I'm very fortunate and grateful that um, there, there was a woman who called me and she was at the Santa Fe auction and she, there was a winter count on a buffalo robe of the boarding schools from 1940s. Wow. And she said it was for sale. Long story short, uh, a woman purchased it for me in honor of my grandmother and my grandfather. And so I'm, delegating 26 women um, in United States and Canada to oversee that uh, that traveling exhibit that it will become 
and it's being funded so that um, that will be traveling. And I brought it today, so I hope that I can show it um, today or um, Friday, I mean, tomorrow. Sorry, yesterday, today, and tomorrow are all the same to me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so the boarding school, I, I survived. I ran away one year in February, and I got the one thing of my life and um, stayed there. But my mother took me out um, the, the next year. That was it. So um, I had a beautiful life in paradise in the bottomlands of Hawaii on Standing Rock. And uh, my home was um, flooded, so we were removed from there. So that's my my story in a nutshell. Um, trying to find answers and uh, resolutions and uh, address the boarding schools. So turning it into a positive experience. That is awesome. You know, Phyllis, I really, really want to really um, encourage you and recognize you and give you all of the recognition right here, right now in front of, you know, all of the viewers and, and let you know that I, I stand in support in everything you do and, and our matriarchal, you're, you're doing actions. You're getting things done for our people. And I really appreciate that. And I hope to be half as good as that you know and and when i get to be you know as young as you are you know and and because because i'm trying to get my aarp and i just cannot seem to get it i did they keep raising that age up on me you know and i just barely hit my 50s and i'm like what you changed it to 55 so i really appreciate that you know i just want to Again, thank you and, and honor you and, and I give you so much respect and thank you for sharing that um, winter count mm -hmm. bundle that you're going to be going around with the, the shirt, the war shirt. And, and you know, what made me really, um, I broke down this past summer and, and I, and, and, you know, it triggered that memory about my, my grandma and, and what she had said to us when we were that little. And I never knew the significance of that that story of why she hugged us and loved us up so much. And and you know, it it just I had to go to the the bedroom and and I just lost it. I lost it for about 15 minutes because, you know, uh, we were listening on the radio and they had told that they were um, repatriating, bringing back some bones from Carlisle to Rosebud. That was this past summer. I think it was maybe the 4th of July or some kind of within that June or July. I don't remember quite when, but um, man, that hurt. That hurt to hear that news. And and I just sat back and, and I was like, you know, my grandma survived that. My grandma made it to where she's my grandma. She was my grandma. And, you know, I, I miss her apple pies. She really made a lot of pies and cookies. You know, I really remember that love. And, you know, now I always tell my wife, you know, geez, I really want oatmeal raisin cookies. So I, we always go and we try to find them. Nope, that don't taste like it, you know, and we go to the next. So I really, really thank you. And, and I know this is very impactful to a lot of people. And however um, we can get involved with you, I would like for you to get involved with us as well. You know, we're Uniting Resilience and um, we're a native two-spirit. My wife and I have been together and in the next few days we'll be celebrating our 16 years together. You know, it's, it's hard to be in a relationship, especially a same-sex relationship. And, 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 you know, we have to leave our people, you know, because we found love and joy with each other and, and our tribe didn't accept us. So in 2009, we left and we just swore to never come back, you know, because they treated us and gay bashed us so badly. And she, I, I have a lot of degrees. She's got degrees and I was law enforcement and I was being gay bashed by the law enforcement. Long story short, you know, my mom got sick and in 2016, she traveled to North Dakota and she, she asked me to move home. She said, we can't travel anymore. You got to come back. 
that's a hard thing that changed me and i had to go into that forgiveness thing you know i had to forgive people from my own tribe and my own relatives come back for my mom because of that request and and i know what mother's love is and i know what it feels like to to watch your mother go through a illness and and pass away you know i was so happy that we came back and she lived until 2019 she passed away in 2000 and and she was able to see my wife and i put into effect the hate crime protection laws on our Ogallasu tribe and crow creek you know and and we were getting ready to pass it and sit in in a color standing rock we came to standing rock and then COVID. so we just stopped all of our travel we're going to be coming to to all of these reservations you know we're working with with the uh, cheyenne river so you'll be seeing us but we also mother earth as one of our biggest things that we honor and, and support and we are doing it in a trying to you know gain knowledge from what has been done you know already by a lot of strong people and and you know i i talked to madonna a few days ago about a week ago and she had um i said you know what 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 about this and i i told her what we were doing and she said you know this is deja vu muffy you know this is that same fight from about 40 years ago she said this is that same war that same war and and she said you're talking about that and you're taking it to with the legislator and you're going to go to the state and you're going to do that and i said yeah and i said we're well, however we can utilize our allies you know we need them and that's important that's that's something to hear and i said what is that what what is holding that from progressing and getting to the next level and she said we are too patriarchal in in that dominance and she said they don't want to respect that matriarch no oh, madonna said that and I, I really look forward to to talking with her later on, but I just know that, you know, in in my Teoshbay of growing up, women were never disrespected. You know, I love my dad, I love love my grandpa, I love all of that. And I never seen my grandpa disrespect any women. You know, I never seen any of that. And how do we change that? You know, I mean, you're sitting here. Oh my goodness, look at all of these things you're accomplishing. And, you know, we should be honoring you with a golden car and, you know, golden everything. You know, you should just just be just awesome. And yet, you know, you couldn't even, they couldn't even give you the floor down here. And and how do we change that? How do we go about, how do, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to navigate through a mentality that I know is, designed to hold that matriarch down and make us be submissive and that's just that colonial thing and however i can help you with this uniting resilience I, I and i know you know robin is the same you know teach us and tell us what we have to do to make this this a, a difference and to change things just like you're doing you know, tell us how to do that, and 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 then we'll close it up after you give. So, what I followed um, one mentor, spiritual mentor, all my life because I wasn't raised uh, traditional. I was raised uh, very colonized, um, uh, Iwashitu, Hotanka, um, just all of it, and. I mastered their education process and um, was very um, patri patriotic, um, raised by, by honorable men who protected us. Um, so I'm grateful for my, my tiwahe and my tiwoshpa. And so um, it was a whole new lesson um, in the American Indian movement that gave me the 
the fearlessness after I knew who I was um, to to have um, the leadership tell us that we were beautiful uh, and um, they acknowledged us and gave us that respect and that dignity and raised us up. So I wanted to share down um, downstairs uh, my experience with um, Miniwi Tony. I worked for Harold Salway back in 1990 and helped them to draft legislation for the waterline at Oglala Nation. Um, and that was the first lessons that I had in spiritual law, Lakota customary law, and um, telling us that uh, Miniwitoni was um, a women's right um, because we all had children. We birthed uh, our nation in water. That was the beginning and it was the first gift that was given to us. Um, so those, um, that spirituality touched off a light in me that got brighter and brighter for 50 years. And so um, I, I learned many, many lessons along the way. I had incredible mentors, men and women who were in the American Indian Movement and Lakota Nation. Um, I would go to Pine Ridge and spend my summers there, um, go to Rosebud. I have five hunka families in, in, in Rosebud, and I have like four hunka families in um, Pine Ridge. So um, I was honored by, um, in the Hochoka, by Ogallala Nation. And that's the highest honor that I have ever uh, received. And I, I hold that number one. And I'm very honored by that. So um, I just, um, along with Crow Dog, acknowledge Wope. Mm -hmm. And we set down the road that, that um, and I committed to that, to, um, to draft the principles of Wope and the spiritual law, where we don't have a choice but to promote and protect um, that wope, she's a female. And so um, the original instructions for that spiritual law is to uplift, praise, honor, protect um, the women. And so that's uh, ingrained in my genetic psyche. And so I'm forever committed to raising up. Um, I have five daughters and um, what we struggled for, we marched for the Trail of Broken Treaties in 1972. We went to Washington with 20 points, including the American Indian Religious Freedom Act and the um, founding uh, tribes were Oglala and Oglala Nation and Standing Rock for the um, Indian Child Welfare Act in White Eagle versus, versus the state of Mississippi and um, the violence that they that they endured because or faced because of taking some of the children back and the resiliency of those people those those children mm -hmm. became productive adults because we embraced them, made sure they had secure homes and um, education and jobs, and they're still thriving today. So um, we can address the human factors in the lives of our children by taking them back and keeping them. And some, some um, will never come back because they found their happiness elsewhere. But we, um, we part of the founding um, of those laws and American Indian Religious Freedom Act was critical to our survival so that we could practice freely um, and do the Sundance, which um, that we need to put in perspective and honor um, those who defied the policies before it was an act 
act, a legal act. So my son was eight years old when he Sundanced at the first uh, legal Sundance in 1978. Wow. And uh, very productive citizen. Um, and so I'm, I know uh, the evidence of what that practice innate. Um, it's in our every day, um, our daily activities, um, even building the teepee, morning star, evening star, and all of the poles that it represents, the virtues, and that big front uh, pole that welcomes you in is um, the reason why there are ribbon skirts, uh, because you decorate that one pole um, to show that you are the, the owner of that home. So we have a lot, a lot of customary law and traditional knowledge that the world is ready to receive. And we have to be um, mindful of who we are and be culturally competent so that we're not being dominant, that we're not dehumanizing that we don't um, put the force um, on other humanity, uh, who other races, um, like they did to us, so that we we actually practice wope and give that dignity out with those principles. And I made that commitment. Um, at some point, we probably will have to digitize it and create the the hard copies yeah. um, for traditional child raising, um, interpret the wakaija, what it means to to have a child, and all of that is born in water. And so what I was sharing downstairs was um, being in the front line and to um, be a plaintiff in 1980 against Union Carbide in the Black Hills, Madonna, and uh, the women of all red nations um, and winning, mm -hmm. being victorious against um, the uranium mining in the Black Hills and to and against the Etsy pipeline, the coal slurry in the water that they were going to take, um, that we defeat it. So when you know that taste of victory, you never want less. Yep. And that you will always, always persist and insist that you have that level of democracy and the principles that are all from those uh, those living and winning experiences. So you never settle for anything less. Wow. Thank you. That is some awesome knowledge. And, and within the next, um, I know you're really busy, but, you know, there's... They're doing a pipeline project from Missouri River here to Rapid City, you know, and I'm not against them. Um, you know, my some of my relatives live here. You know, my extended relatives live here in, in, in Rapid. I live here. And um, you know, I'm not against that water pipeline, but I'm just, uh, I want information because, you know, our tribes don't know. You know, I, I called Madonna. You know, I called I called Chuck, and and I think we were reaching out to Robin, and her Facebook was deactivated or something, and I was and in so jail. <laughs> she was in Facebook jail, and uh, you know, I started contacting people from all these different uh, tribes, and and they didn't know about it. They didn't know about it, and and we just crashed a um, meeting yesterday, you know, to try to get information. You know, what are you doing? You know, we raise our hands and. But we got there before they even started their, you know, Robert's Rules of Order. And so they put their agenda up and here, uh, you know, Madonna was sitting there and then my wife and then me and then there was Robin and I think uh, Blair. And uh, then, it, then there's some white people sitting there and, and they said, okay, so let's start the meeting. We're starting it at uh, 3, 305 or something it was. And so everybody stood up all the board members the white people and you know they all put their hands on their chest and they said i pledge allegiance and 
So we all kind of took the cue and looked at Madonna and she was sitting there, you know, she was, so we thought, well, you know, we'll just sit here then. And so we kind of did a Colin Kaepernick to the, 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 the Pledge of Allegiance at that meeting. And we were all women, all indigenous women. And then we looked across and even our camera girl, she was sitting there. She didn't even move either. She didn't stand up. So, you know, I, and that really, um, that really felt empowering. You know, to sit there with and, and Madonna, she didn't even know. She didn't even know that they were, she was like, What? What? You know? <laughs> so, I mean, but that put that whole room in a state of uh, shock. You know, they, 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 they didn't know why we were there. They were kind of freaked out that we didn't stand up for their Pledge of Allegiance. And these are all Republican presidents from the water districts here in Rapid City, the surrounding Pennington County area. And the person that invited me was a Republican. And, you know, he sent me the agenda. And, and so they started off and, you know, I raised my hand because we didn't see it on the agenda. And, and I asked them, you know, what about this $1.9 billion project? Are you guys going to talk about that? What's going on? And, Oh, no, 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 no. You know, this, this guy got up and he was just like, and he was shaking, you know, and, and she, she recorded it too. And he, it wasn't 1.9 billion, you know, that hasn't even been discussed yet. It's still in the making. And um, they ended up spinning off. They didn't want that board to control them. So they made themselves a 501c3 nonprofit. So that $1.9 billion water project, spun off and don't want no regulatory and they're a nonprofit all by themselves so they don't have to be regulated and so that's what we found out and so we got in contact with the lady called back tonight and she's she's going to set up a meeting with us for january so i hope you can make it we will invite you and um i don't know exactly when in january uh, um or, or sometime but she will give a presentation to all of the tribes, whoever we could bring in. And so we'll set that up somewhere here in Rapid and, you know, CDC uh, guidelines, COVID and everything. But if you can participate and help us out, bring some good knowledge to that. I will bring our quantification code and um, it's being talked about uh, this week. Mm -hmm. And um, the Ocheche Shakoi own the property rights of the entire river system to the headwaters of Montana, to the tail waters uh, where the Missouri meets the Mississippi. And every tribe has quantified over the years. So Standing Rock is something like 1.3 million acre feet. And each tribe up and down the river owns the entire system. So it, we do have a comprehensive um, quantification code um, and the IRS uh, table that goes with it. So it is established mm -hmm. um, and I will bring that to the awesome. meeting. Yes, so just give us your information and, and what number to call so we don't have to go through all these channels to get to you. But um, okay. thank you and, and you know, I reached out to one of my friends who's an engineer and he said, you know, if they made that a nonprofit and they're util trying to use the tribes right of way, they're going to sell that water. They're going to sell it and they're going to probably benefit million that 1.9 billion isn't even going to be a drop in the hat. They're going to make way more than that. They're going to go into the trillions and what they make. So, I really appreciate it if you can bring rally the troops and we'll get that in operation and go in in the meeting and thank you. And if you want to say any closing remarks and then we'll go to Robin or you. Okay. Um, so state of South Dakota exercises prior appropriation and as does North Dakota with prior appropriation. Um, so the state uses, uh, or takes the water. And so South Dakota 
by having three wind projects with free water um, with solar and electricity uh, generate enough uh, energy that they um, are 10% of the national wow. energy from the water here in South Dakota. North Dakota is attempting the same uh, by using the free water. So it's incumbent upon us to um, put that quantification code mm -hmm. on the table. Yep. Right on. Well, I look forward to seeing you again, and, and hopefully we can get that meeting up and running in January. So thank you for coming, and, and I look forward to visiting you later. But we'll go ahead and thank give you. it to you for some closing. Thank you, Phyllis. Go ahead, Rob. Okay. So I just wanted to go back real fast, if I could, to um, you mentioned about the boarding schools, and I just wanted to say that was where some of my real re re resistance um, started because um, my grandparents also taught me that although I didn't have a real boarding school upbringing, there's the we always talk about the boarding school like um, Phyllis was um live during the boarding school, but some of us are products also of another generation of boarding school. So I wanted to, um, I, I'm sorry, I have to take notes. I'm a brain injury survivor. So I have my glasses on and my notepad. So just sorry. Um, <laughs> You're okay. And so I, I wanted to just acknowledge the people who are also um, a generation of those that come after boarding schools because there's a dormitory life and that is still a boarding school today. Mm -hmm. So Cheyenne Eagle Butte School, um, for example, is a boarding school that's still in existence today with a dormitory um, system. And so when you first went to the dormitory after boarding school, you still got washed up with some powder to make sure you didn't have hey hey as and stuff. <laughs> you still had to scrub the... Uh, <laughs> Um, if you're naughty, like you said, you ran away, mm -hmm. you know, you had to scrub the kitchen floor with a toothbrush and eat some ramen noodles. So that was still a product the Matrians had of their boarding school way of life, you know, growing up. And so some of those mentalities mm -hmm. are still there, like, and they're getting better, you know, because they're breaking those cycles. But how we were taught is if you saw some uh, folks coming to the door, you know, you hid you know, you hid and you made sure, and it's kind of like that mental health too. You don't want to seek out mental health help because they can put you in Redfield. Yeah. You know, yeah. You can I go heard to, about that. You can yeah. go to, um, hollow, what's that one new place called Halawasa or something? Is that how you say it? The insane asylum, mm -hmm. you know, but we were taught that stuff. That Springfield. Stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. that, that's that mentality. You know, you don't talk to those people cause you're going to go to Redfield. Mm -hmm. And so you stay away, you know, if you want to talk to something, you talk to Tenkashala mm -hmm. and you work through that. You know, we have a way of life. You go to Nikaga, you know, um, you, you seek out those spiritual leaders like uh, uh, Phyllis was talking about Wolpe, you know, mm -hmm. our, our natural way. we got to always remember to stay rooted. Yep. And so I wanted to say that, too, is rooted. If we don't remember our way of life in that natural creation and, and Pete Sawi, she brought us these real huge sacred, you know, mm -hmm. laws and ways of life. And, you know, she crumbled a man. That's why I always tell them, the men, you know, if you don't start respecting us, remember when we were famined, she came and she helped us. Mm -hmm. And when you were wandering eyes, she crumbled you to bones. So remember how strong she is. And we're, I also wanted to, um, so I wanted to talk to that and, and that boarding school um, mentality is also another generation. So seventh, eighth, ninth generations, we got to also start looking past the seventh generation. You know, Lala, Sitting Bull, and all of them look to the seventh generation, but we are new generations now. And and that's dealing with with the two-spirit society. Mm -hmm. our, our, you know, you came to my, I felt so sad that day because they said, sorry, we cannot help you guys develop a hate crime or our same-sex marriage uh, law. Why? Because I am Christian. And Catholic, it's Catholic, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and we have our Catholic way of um, thinking in um, the Bible and the marriage. And it mm -hmm. says what it says in this Bible. And um, he also says to love one another. You know, that's a commandment, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and ten, the ten, 10 commandments. So, I mean, that was disheartening. And we still haven't been able to bring that forth and, and, and get it to our districts and hate. And then they wanted to bring in the half blood in the 
the the half blood as in the yesca laws and all of that yep. as a hate crime yep. you know and so they're just trying anything to look over the basic human rights of being protected and they knew nothing about matthew shepherd no. you know and so this was our law and order committee and so i felt really sad that day and i was really heartbroken to hear one of our youth uh presenting you know mm-hmm. and and he was disheartened and he was being bullied in school and so um those are those mindsets, you know, breeding mindsets and stuff. And so I wanted to discuss that um, boarding school mentality. And um, I also wanted to talk also, you guys mentioned Carlisle, my my mom, my Ina lives in Pennsylvania. So uh, it was hard to go to Carlisle quite a bit, but we, we went there. And so the whereabouts unknown, there's a list um, out there. Every tribe has a whereabouts unknown. And it's really huge that we hit the 1960s. Um, there's a couple of cases of switched at birth and we can't, we can't let IHS go um, um, held accountable for what they did when them illegal takings of our children's happened, you know, because mm-hmm. they were responsible for illegal takings before the BIA social service. And these, and these two entities don't know what happened to our children. So not only do they have unmarked graves, but the Indian Health Service and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Social Service are thieves of our children too. Yep. They illegally took our children. I have a, a, a missing uh, uh, Lekshi who, who's got an IAM account. And, and I bet a lot of pe- folks out there have missing people. If you go look at the whereabouts unknown, they don't know where our relatives are. No. So we can't forget those relatives that have no accounting. We don't know if they're dead or alive. And some of them are on that list that we know where they're at. But there's still some like my, my Lexi who we have absolutely no idea where he's at. And so the courts either have those those um, cases sealed and you can't get into them, but there's two entities and that's that's the agent in- entities, the IHS, Indian Health Service, and the Bureau of... In- Everyone always forgets about that. BIA, social <laughs> service, they always blaming the mm-hmm. DSS, but mm-hmm. the Bureau sent some, some traders in here too. So the whereabouts on those. So the DSS built that resilience and my grandparents always told me don't don't answer that door, you know, yeah. watch out for those people. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how do we change that ma- matriarchal system? Yes, uh, Phyllis, too. And I think that we need to remind our Wichasha societies and our, our treaty societies that we are part of the Wapi. The Peite Sanwi, we have to remember that the stories, if we do not um, keep reminding the people, like I said in the beginning, and I said on Monday, if we don't remind people of our creation stories and, and who we are as rooted as Lakotas in a mm-hmm. part of the Titama and, um, and who we are and are rooted to our stories, if we remind them, that's why, they're, that's why there's this division and this conquer and divide is, be, uh, is because um, they're forgetting who, who my mom always taught me is is the husband and wife and all of them um they went back to their keepies and they made laws mm-hmm. and they consulted so mm-hmm. you guys go back and you consult you and your wife consult and you're probably talking about the day's events and other couples here might go back and discuss what's going and then so we had a place at that table, even yeah. though they're saying we don't have a place right. at that table. Absolutely. And if I'm done with this marriage, I'm going to set your bag out there. And mm-hmm. that was done. Yeah. We had whip keepers and a way to control these societies. Our societies were so fierce. There was none of this chaos like it is today. No domestic violence. Nope. And no it, suicide. No rape. No. no talking back. Kids knew their protocols. You know, the, the adults are, are talking right now. You wait your turn. All of that. We were fierce you know um so there was this whoopee there was this way of life you know and so we have to remember those rooted ways in that matriarchal system i wasn't just made to wash clothes and cook and clean right you know yep um and i wasn't just made to just be quiet and sit here and make your dinner and serve you no Mm -hmm. um i'm 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 here to create loss so i do have a i i feel like why did he put me here I'm, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. So that's how I feel we change that, is we keep reminding them of what this law is. If you want to be a traditional treaty council, councils, then you remember these laws. Yeah, you know? yes. yep. yep. And then I wanted to end by um, saying that the reason why I'm here 
is because of the water. And um, and I want to remind anyone, if you can make any laws or anything, is that we remind people that our waterways are, are living, breathing, and that that river is living and breathing, and that it's alive. And we have to start creating that law and treating it like it's living and breathing. They want to protect the wild mustangs and stuff because them are our Shunka Wakan nation. They're our relatives and the Buffalo nation and the flower nation and all of that. Well, our river and our tributaries and all of our, our waterways and are all living and breathing because like um, uh, uh, Phyllis explained and a lot of people in is water is life. And that's because that umbilical cord and that baby is growing in, in a water and how much of the earth is made up of water. And you yeah. guys know the story and everybody out there knows the story. So we need to create those laws. And that's why I asked them to create this law using the decoration that she talked about. Remember I told them yeah. Yeah. using the decoration of indigenous rights, reminding them that we have a right to human rights declaring that our water is living and breathing. We need it to be safe and able to drink. And we can't do that if it's mercury infested and, and uh, uranium. uranium and sulfur and all of that. And our people need clean drinking water. And they all, the state passed that clean, clean drinking water act. Um, the feds have to regulate it. Our tribes have to take a stance. So again, I want to thank um, Uniting Resistance, uh, Resilience. Indigenous, Resilient, sorry, and um, Indigenous, uh, Indigenous uh, water, water Alliance, Alliance and uh, Lakota People's Project and all of my allies out there, especially all my mentors, Phyllis, Madonna, um, many of the grandmas, uh, uh, Lala Ray Hamboy, um, my late Lala Vincent brings plenty, um, all of my um, mentors, if it wasn't for you, Lala's um, out there, all the treaty councils for teaching me, I wouldn't be here still being resilient um, after everything, being able to take a stand back. So, happy wash day. Remember to stay rooted in your ways and take a stand at something. Make it water. Thank you, Robin. And and I just wanted to add to your li your list of in the BIA and the DSS and the um, IHS is uh, you know they 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 had a time frame there. I think it was in the 60s or 70s that they sterilized our native women. You know, and and where is that at? You know, and and my wife and I were invited to a conference one time, and we came upon this meeting, and you know, we cried with a lot of these women, that that and their older elder ladies, and and they didn't get the chance to experience um, motherhood because they went in just for like the dentist or something, and they came out sterilized. You know, and, and there was a time frame, so those need to be in held in Colombo as well. But I, I always want to end by saying, um, you know, the best thing about our indigenous people is clear mind, clear body, clear soul, and always respect each other, respect our, our wing nation, respect our um, four-legged, respect our insects, always respect Mother Earth and the water that is, is there. But for one thing, always respect yourself. And, you know, you can log on to any of our websites and, and you know, join our fight and, and reach out to us and contact us. But the best thing that will happen for Indigenous people is to stay sober. You know, don't drink, don't do drugs. And I, I ask that with, with a good, kind heart that, that we all try to unify we need to bring unity of all of our people. We can't do this alone. We have our allies and we, we need we need all of you to help. And I wanna say Ilamaya Wopila Tanka to everybody that watched today and that is a part of this. And we look forward to doing these again and, and we'll reach out and we'll keep everybody informed on this upcoming meeting and another meeting coming up of all of our Ocheti Shakoe. So thank you, Robin, for coming and I look forward to the next one. How? Dakuye Uyasi. Wait, 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 wait. Man, my ears are just burning. <laughs>